Welcome to the 79th episode of the Nerdum and Other Nonsense Anime Podcast. Today we are covering the third week of the winter 2019 anime season. As always, we include timestamps in the description of the YouTube video and podcast feed if you only want to hear about one or two specific shows, since we will spoil everything per usual. My name is Leo, and my stand is loving bad anime so much that they become perfect in my own mind. I call my stand the casual anime fan. <laughs> also with me are Becom and Cat. Nice. Oh, hi. <laughs> oh, got such a good stand, Leo. It explains so much, really. It really does, honestly. Yeah. It's the perfect stand for you. It did my Doroku do- 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 research for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, what show did you watch uh, for many years to hone your the skill of your stand, Leo? Oh, man. Jesus. <laughs> you, you know, you just it's just the basics you watch over and over. Like, I've seen Cowboy Bebop a hundred times. Dragon Ball Z, you know, fuck that Dragon Ball stuff. Uh, yeah, that's how <laughs> hardcore casual anime fan I am. I'm just gotcha. imagining that your stand, like, you know how they all have their little forms? Your stand comes out yeah. and it's like wearing a Naruto headband. And it's, it's like sporting a, a shirt from the latest isekai. It's just like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! You know, it's a uh, oh Olivia's brother from Asobi Asobes. I say that's yeah. pretty Taki much guy. pretty much straight up what it, he looks like. It oh looks my like. gosh, that would be epic! <laughs> like just have that guy like show up, and that's your stand. <laughs> So yeah, your stand's like wearing like a flannel shirt with like yeah. the Naruto headband, glasses. <laughs> oh, Oh, it's so good. It's really good. Uh, all right. So uh, let's get into what nonsense we got into this week. Uh, I'll kick it off. I've been catching up on movies as per usual near like the end of the year, beginning of the new year. And so I watched the movie Sorry to Bother You hmm. uh, from last year, which. OK, so if anybody's if you've seen Get Out like Jordan Peele's movie that's like sort of like a horror about like the black experience uh, in like white America. Yeah. Um, Sorry to bother you is very similar in that where it's like set up around like a guy and a girl who are dating and the guy like gets a job at this telemarketing company and like it's like very ominous and like he to rise up the ranks. He just needs to stick to the script and put on his white voice when he's talking oh, to customers. I saw advertisements. Oh, it didn't look yeah. sinister mm-hmm. though at all. It looked very like comedy driven. So it, it starts off like sort of lighthearted and then it gets more and more sinister as it goes until it just becomes like the most brutal movie I've maybe ever watched. <laughs> like it is so insane. The places that this movie goes and trying to like tell like metaphors for like, both like the black experience in America and the experience of like poor people trying to rise up against like the oppression of the rich. Mm -hmm. Um, That it's just like an epic metaphor and it's just freaking batshit insane near the end. I don't want to spoil it, but I would highly recommend watching this movie. It's really cool. I may take you up on that because that sounds really interesting. Uh, Did you watch on anything specifically? I was streaming it maybe. Uh, no, I just, okay. uh, my friend had, like, the Blu-ray, so I watched it Be at calm. his house. how dare you? Now we have to go look up where the fuck this is streaming. <laughs> I'll look that up while you guys talk about nonsense. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a new game, free game that came out, it's new Battle Royale. It's Apex Legends, and it's made by the people who made Titanfall, so that's really cool. I got to play a little bit of it yesterday. I really didn't play too much, but it seems really fun. Um. Uh, the gunplay and the abilities seem seem neat. I actually had to do some research today to figure out the abilities on everybody because I didn't have any idea what they did yesterday. And there's basically your three classes. There's like an offensive, a defense, and a, and a support. And your teams of three against another, I don't remember, another 20 teams of three maybe. But Yeah, you, can like, you can't even ever play solo. Like it'll always no, match you up with like two people, yeah, right? Yeah, it just came out two days ago or something like that so mm-hmm. yeah they're they're probably going to do updates they're actually i saw they were actually asking earlier you know what do you guys want so they'll probably end up doing a bunch of different game modes like Fortnite does and stuff like that but that i did like it it looked beautiful um i'm pretty sure it's in 60 frames per second because it was very smooth i played it on the xbox mm-hmm. um but yeah so how do you I, like the uh characters like the hero characters their characters designs really, and their abilities they're really yeah. unique uh and they're very diverse. So there's like, there's, I also noticed there was three women. Uh, I think all three were not white. The one, I 
the one that was white was like maybe Asian, and then the mm-hmm. other two, she sound one of them sounded Jamaican, and the other girl, uh, she was uh, black. I don't know what specifically. I didn't play with her, but I only th- thought that about the other girl because of her accent. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's just like the the three guys, the robot. and there's a <laughs> robot. <laughs> the robot can huh. make like zip lines and stuff. That was kind of cool. Yeah, he seemed the most useless to me when I was looking into it. But I do plan mm-hmm. on playing a lot more and reporting back my experience on this game because the people I play Fortnite with are really getting into it. So we'll have a fun time. But and the funny thing is, at the moment, everybody sucks at this game. It ha- it has some <laughs> weird learning curve. Like, and I'm talking just like other content uh, streamers who are known for being very good. They're in there and they're just sucking. And we're everybody's still having fun. It's just like getting around this learning curve is kind of rough and <laughs> I don't, we don't haven't really figured it out yet but looking up the abilities actually helped me a lot today i'm like oh, okay so i'm kind of in my mind i was like if my other partners pick this character i probably won't pick that one which is really neat because when you load into the match it randomizes on your on your team who gets to pick who first so you can't have like doubles or triples of people so oh, cool. somebody picks an offensive guy you know do i want to go heavy on the offensive with them or do maybe i want to run the support class or even if the other two pick their people then you're like oh i definitely need to run the support class if i right. with these two because yeah. i know it works really well with them and stuff like that and i think that would be really cool but like i said i plan on playing a whole lot more and having a, a lot more things to say later on so cool that's it for me cat oh okay so not a ton happened this week but I will say, I did find out my dog may have superhuman powers. So, oh, my God. <laughs> actually, Tell this happened more. today. So, okay. First so your life all, is turning into an anime? Yeah. <laughs> my dog all, has superhuman powers. That's, that's an yeah, anime title. <laughs> pretty much. So I came home from work, and I just hear this, like, okay, so my dog can't actually bark. She can only make this, like, ultrasonic whistle noise. Right, yeah. What? Um, you've heard it before, yeah. The like, oh, the, like the, whiny whistling noise yeah, that dogs make. Yeah, it yeah. sounds sort of oh, like okay. a tea kettle okay. going off. Um, but so I, all I hear is like ah, ah, from like under the bed, and I'm like, "What the fuck?" And I go, and like my bed is so far down that like you, she cannot fit under there. Like it's way too small a space, and like it's a really heavy bed frame. Somehow she trapped herself under the bed. <laughs> Probably chasing the cat like an idiot. And like <laughs> she, but like the in, inside, like after you get past the frame is actually, there's enough room for her, but she was trapped. Like she couldn't get out from under it. <laughs> so she's oh been just God. trapped under there all oh, I know. I'm day. Told, I'm not surprised at all she got under there. Huskies are uh, known for being escape artists. Well, but I tried to get her out, right? Because she's like, help me, help me. Yeah. And like, she's too fucking big. Like, her, she physically can't. There's no way. I don't know how the <laughs> hell she got in there. <laughs> and, and so after like 20 minutes of trying to pull her out and like, she can't go. And I'm like, fuck. And I finally had to like lift the whole bed frame up like a mother, like lifting her fucking car off her child <laughs> so that the dog could get out from under the fucking bed like an idiot. <laughs> Also, this weekend, she ate, like, three ox bones, because uh, my boyfriend made, like, something with ox bones in it, mm-hmm. and, like, an ox tail, I think, I don't know, and, like, yeah. we gave her some, and she, and we were like, oh, she'll just eat the meat off it, and then we'll take it away from her. Well, we turn around, and, like, five minutes have passed, and it's just gone. Like, there's nothing. Like... <laughs> <laughs> like and, and she's not been sick, so I guess she's fine. Like... Yeah, I think your so, dog is like the little girls from Kamuri Kusa, where it just eats anything and then yep. just like poops out <laughs> like new things, like new complete structures to Maybe. rebuild society. Maybe, yeah. Oh, that's but- it's funny you say that because there's a Facebook picture where my uh, cousin cousin's wife posted a picture of their dog with a deer leg in its mouth, and it wanted them to take it from it, throw it for her. She was like, "No, I'll pass." <laughs> <laughs> All right. You guys ready to talk about some anime? Maybe. Yeah. All right, Kat, you're leading it off with Mob okay. Psycho 100. Mob so, Cat. All right. So, episode three One Danger After Another Degeneration. So, apparently, they made a homepage after the last <laughs> episode yeah. where, where Ray was That's like, awesome. We can make a homepage. And I'm like, Oh, no, he's learning. Um, so, so they fucking do that. And then they start the intro OP and like, okay, I thought this before, but I thought to myself, you're hearing things because you're a pervert. 
Mm-hmm. Like, and they're and they're playing the the opening. What do you guys hear when you when you hear the opening? I hear like music and stuff. I don't know. Uh, what, do, what do you hear? <laughs> okay, come on. I've not made that paid that enough attention to really try to think it, what they're it saying. It sounds very okay. So, like the actual lyrics say, "Get ready, get ready to set me off." I feel Ooh. your fascination. Come on. I feel your satisfaction. Get ready. Get ready to set me off. Oh, but- God. I haven't thought about this this way. <laughs> <laughs> but what I hear when I'm when, when they chant it is, get ready. Get ready to suck me off. Am I the only one who thinks this? <laughs> okay. Now, you, uh, all the listeners, will only be able to hear that from now on. I'm, Thanks, it Kat. It sounds just like that. <laughs> Progress to mob explosion <laughs> takes on a whole different meaning. <laughs> so oh I have God. now dubbed this the blowjob OP because it, it sounds just like that. I, oh, I can't man. be the only one who is hearing that. Well, I'm never, I'm never gonna not hear it now. <laughs> yeah, I watch it. So that's great. Yeah. Thanks, Cat. Uh, you're, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. So after that experience, um, you, they go back to the anime, and you get. You, uh, you find out they get this new client that wants them to curse someone. Um, Ray agrees to do so, like, kind of just to appease him. And then mm-hmm. he just pretends that he's writing this curse. He, like, he's like, oh, and, like, gets all dramatic and is like, <laughs> yeah. ah, and then writes something on a piece of paper and is like, I've cursed them. He's, like, covering with his arm so the guy can't see what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, what? Are we in, like, middle school? <laughs> the guy yeah. takes it. He's like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> like, I, what I is this piece give, of garbage? Yeah, I will give Ray credit because he doesn't charge him for it. Mm-hmm. I totally expected him to charge him for it. Didn't you? I was like, yeah. oh, he's definitely, like, he's a con man at heart. I mean, he's a good guy. I have but- noticed this season, he's, they're showing, a, like, a more nicer side of him. Because, like, last season, yeah, we totally expected it. Yeah. yeah it's almost like they're taking, I don't like that, though. Because, like, I like the the idea that he is a nice guy, but he's also a con man, right? Yeah. Like, I like he that. He plays both ways. Yeah, yeah. but he's kind of also uh, Mob's mentor. So I think that's why they took a different direction this season a little bit. I mean, but it's fun when adults are, are not responsible. Let's be honest. <laughs> oh, like, I don't know. You're upset about that uh, teacher from Yuru Camp. <laughs> I mean, but that's just over the line. There's like, there's an acceptable range, right? right? I, I like Mob and his deep thoughts this episode. So like on this guy, he, he's like, the curse might not be real, but the guy will go on thinking he's actually cursing somebody. How will this mm-hmm. affect him as time goes on? I'm like... Damn, Mob, when have you ever put this much thought into anything? <laughs> yeah, Mob's having a lot of thoughts this episode, or this season. He's just really deeply thinking. I, al- I always think he thinks deeply. It's just that they're, I think in this season, they're d- dealing more with his inner monologue than they did last mm-hmm. season. Um, so we get to see more of it. But I think he's always been a pretty thoughtful guy. Um, I also think he, he didn't only think it's dangerous for the guy to be thinking about cursing someone. I, it's almost like he thinks it might manifest somehow. Mm-hmm. Like all of that dark energy or something. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and and you see a lot of themes this season. I think where Mob is being encouraged to like tell his opinion more and say things and like fight for what he wants to do, which is interesting. But doesn't somebody yeah. at one point go, "Wow, Mob's giving his opinion about something he doesn't do that." <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Hmm. But um, yeah, later the same day they get a call from another guy, uh, another lady. And she thinks there's a spirit following her, who at first she thought was a stalker, but now she thinks it's a spirit. And she says it stares at her through the window. (laughs) And, like, she's barred up all the windows, which, I mean, it's scary, but it's also funny to think of her sitting there being like, I'm gonna bar this up! (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And then the room starts shaking and things start falling over. And the spirit is upset that she called these psychic people in. And you and you see the figure figure outside the window, and Mob is like, "No, this is a living person. This isn't a spirit." And he's in the next apartment, and I guess it's like a guy <laughs> who has like supernatural powers, and he's using this out of body power he has to stalk yeah. her. Ast- astral projection is like the yeah nerdy term. <laughs> and he gets carted off to jail, and like the lady is just like, "Oh well, I should have been scared." Da 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 da. This jerk, and like Mob is really thoughtful and how he, he's sort of puzzled about why her fear is evaporated basically once she knew it was a person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That one, that one was really obvious to me because humans are naturally wary about the unknown. Yeah. 
So once yeah. she figured out it wasn't a ghost and it was actually an actual human physical fact being, she was like, oh, I'm not afraid of it anymore. <laughs> well, but it's still the unknown because it's still a power that she's unfamiliar with. That's true. But yeah. it's, I don't know, it's like her own kind, I guess. I don't, but the, so the other thing I really liked about that guy's introduction is like when he opens the apartment door, he's like kind of like mumbling under his breath. And on Crunchyroll, at least, they made the subtitles like really small to reflect that he's talking so softly, <laughs> like that you can barely hear it. And I was like, oh man, good job, Crunchyroll. That like, actually <laughs> added something to the show. That was pretty good. Yeah, that is good. But yeah, so then they have this, uh, cl- this like kids that come and they want them to protect them from evil spirits while they take a spirit photo <laughs> in a haunted house. And so they take the picture. They drive all the way out to this haunted house. They take the picture. They're about to head back when finally Ray asks them about the money, like a fee. They're, he's like, how much are you going to give me? Like, give me something. And they're like, oh. You didn't do anything. It's a scam and like leave without them. So like now they have to find a ride back too. And they didn't get any money. And I was like, <laughs> damn. But also like he should have fucking asked about money before he went anywhere with them. Well, yeah. Like that's stupid of Ray. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, from so a like, business sense, this is, yeah, very, he didn't do a good job or at least sign some form or something like that. Yeah. Absolutely. Sign like a little contract or something. And like, yeah, so they get in the mid card, like there's that like little mid card of them get getting a like oh, what is it called when you uh god hailing a cab? No, yeah, but they don't hail a cab, they get into like somebody's truck because they like wave them down. Uh what's oh. that called when you like go across the country in other people's cards? Why why can I think of this fucking word? You mean hitchhiking? hitchhiking? Thank you, God. I started laughing and I couldn't say it. I couldn't fucking who, figure it out. My brain is broken. That a lot. Yeah. Okay, so no, but the funniest thing, Leo, because this is what I want to really get to, is like right after the midpoint of the episode, Bob is walking on the street, and the fat guy from Aromanga Sensei is running. I swear to God, it's the same fat guy oh who was running God. in every episode of Aromanga Sensei. He's back, and now he's running in Mob Psycho. I'm so proud of him, but he still hasn't lost <laughs> he's any weight. Keeping it up. <laughs> <laughs> Becomes like, it's such a shame. He's just trying so hard. Also, I recently watched, there was like an Aero Manga OVA that came out, mm-hmm. and the fat guy gets a whole group of other guys who are now running with him because he's inspired all of them. And I was like so happy because like when Leo and I were watching through that show for like the Drink Your Way Through episodes, like he was like our favorite character. <laughs> we kept like rooting him on. And like that was like the subplot that we actually enjoyed from that show. <laughs> so anyway, I was happy to see that here too. Yeah, we really need to do more drink your way through. Maybe we should pick something totally heinous, like handshakers. Just domestic something that will girlfriend? make us vomit in our mouth. What? We could do domestic girlfriend. <laughs> but we're no. already watching it. You can't that doesn't work that way. What handshakers and wise would be interesting. What was yeah. the other oh, the Shield Hero show and the impressions where I was talking about like I knew the bridge was out for this train, so like I'm just waiting for the community to explode on it. Oh, we could do Shield Heroes if it continues oh, no. to be terrible. God. So oh, like God. having read <laughs> Domestic Girlfriend, I'm sitting here and I'm I especially after looking over your guys' notes, I'm like, oh my fucking God, this is going to get so much more worse. <laughs> <laughs> so excited. Uh, oh we'll yes, talk we're about here it later. for every trashy second, Leo. Okay. But yeah, anyway, back to the <laughs> Mob Psycho. Um the next day, Mob gets bullied by these kids from his school who are looking for money. Suddenly, one of them, like, just starts acting really crazy and, like, strips down and starts, like, dancing and doing all this weird shit. And, like, Dimple is fucking with them. Like, the ghost Dimple. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Making yeah. them, like, get undressed and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And then Mob's like, stop it, Dimple. And, like, Dimple stops it. I'm like, no, don't tell him to stop it. <laughs> like, and, of course, the guy's immediately like, oh, I'm going to go back to bullying you. Even though that shit just happened. And, like, his brother comes up and is like dude, don't do that, and, like, fucks with them, and, like, yeah, like and then he, basically... he makes him shake real quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then the whole jock club, I forget what sport they're in. Well, it's, like, the body improvement club. Yeah, That's like yeah, they're yeah, just a the workout club. club. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and they, they all come up, and they're like, what you doing? Like, stop messing with that friend. They so totally, yeah. totally bro him by getting around him and, like, squeezing him in oh, between yeah. him. Yeah, I, I love like... that. <laughs> <laughs> That's really uh, good. Yeah, basically it's clear he's got friends now. And but they're all all like, dude, we shouldn't have to do this. Like you you can do this for yourself. Like, don't have us do it for you. 
which I thought was good. Um, oh, and then after school that day, those clients from before are back. And I was immediately like, no, Ray, don't let those fuckers in your office. Be yeah, like, right. oh, you have, you have a ghost problem? Oh, so sorry for you. But you can't come in. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> they do say that they'll buy, like, the most expensive package. So I think that probably, like, changed his mind. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, they want them to go back and get rid of the ghost in the picture because I guess they're freaked out by the fact that it's there. Like, it's not bothering them, from my understanding. It, they're just upset yeah. that it exists, which to yeah, me... Yeah, which is, like, kind of shitty. But I guess uh, knowing that those things are out there can, like keep you up at night i guess i don't know yeah so they go out there and mob's about to like get rid of it but then he finds out that the three ghosts are a family and they died together i guess and they want to stay here together for a while before they move on and mob is caught between like wanting to do what he believes is best and pleasing the clients and ray who he really cares about Mm -hmm. Um, and this causes him like a fuck ton of mental stress and he's like sweating and like you see it's just really weighing on him um, and then Dimple comes up and he's like trying to make the situation, I think, easier for Mob, like to test the ghost to see if it could be, it could turn into an evil ghost. And he's like, if you kill the, the clients, like then we won't have to exercise you. And the ghost like considers it and he, you can see he has the power to do it. But then he just like kneels on the ground and is like, please don't exercise us. Like, I don't want to kill these people and I won't, but like, I really would like to stay here. And, and Mob's just like, oh, fuck. Um, and, and Ray's like, well, you don't have to do it because I can see it's bothering you. And like, we're just going to say we exercise them. And we didn't really. And he like throws a bunch of salt in the air and he's like, it's over. And, you know, they go to dinner um, and they leave the three ghosts behind. And Mob is like, I'm really worried because even though probably it's fine, like, what if something happens to those clients? And like, you know, I'm I'm torn between taking care of the clients and taking care of. The ghosts and like Ray sort of realizes that for Mob, like the undead and the human worlds are equal in importance. Mm -hmm. Like there's not a difference. Like one is not higher than the other. Um, but yeah, and then at the very end of the episode, Ray finds out like that guy put a curse on him, and like it's not a big deal because Dimple just gets rid of it. But I almost wonder if that guy is going to come back. I wonder. Yeah, and that might be. be a plot point. Um. And then Mob, like, has this moment in the tub later that night uh, wondering about what will happen if he ever changes as a person and, like, wants to hurt people with his powers and if anyone would be able to stop him if he did become a bad person. And that, like, really terrifies him. And that was interesting. I think that was the most interesting part of the show for me. Yeah, like, all of the stuff with Mob, like, considering his, like, whole whole personal philosophy of, like, you know, if, like, the people in, like, our spirits are on equal terms with people, then if there are bad people, should he use his powers to get rid of them? And that thought kind of, like, terrifies him. I think that's why he's, like, shaking in sweat. That's Uh, true. Because he's like, if I'm going to truly protect this family of spirits... I have to hurt those e- those bad people who want to get rid of them. It's kind of the same way he's had to exercise evil spirits to like take care of people in the past. Yeah. So, yeah, he's like having that reality come crashing down on his soul shoulders. And then, yeah, that scene in the bathtub where he's like, if I did turn against people, would there be anyone who could stop me? Mm-hmm. And, yeah, who knows? Yeah, it's a very deep thought episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, not a super fun episode. But. And animation continues to be freaking spectacular. I really liked, like Kat was saying, the animation of like the the spirit's father when he like grows like really angry for a second before like oh, kneeling yeah. back down. Mm-hmm. It was really that was cool. Epic. Uh, and just like I like Dimple. <laughs> <laughs> Dimple's cool. <laughs> he's kind of, yeah, I think All Dimple's right. better this season than he was last. Yeah, he's getting a little bit more like time to shine so far. I like mm-hmm. him a lot. <clears throat> uh, All right. Moving on to Tuesdays, we've got Run with the Wind, uh, which I thought had a really good episode called You're mm-hmm. Not Alone. It did have a good episode, Leo. What did you think of it? it well, let's talk about, I'll talk about the, the very beginning part because Leo <laughs> has a lot to say about that, which I think is really funny. Um, uh, it's the only moment in this show 
that <laughs> truly grabbed me and I could relate to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the beginning of the episode, it starts with Haiji, who is playing a video about the Hakone Ekiden for the whole team. And he has the lights off and like the volume pretty low. And they're all like looking intently, right? As Haiji quietly explains how each of us will hand a sash from one to the next and eventually like we'll be the first uh, university to qualify for the Hakone on our first try. And like ha- Haiji goes and like turns the lights on after this big speech and finds that like everyone is just fucking asleep. Oh my god, <laughs> dude. I started I fucking lost it. I was like, I can so fucking relate to this. This is me in this goddamn show. I fuck dude, it's like the show did a dig on itself and I I just fucking died. I I immediately messaged you guys i was like somebody please watch the first minute and 30 of this episode because i fucking lost my shit watching it (laughs) is that the part where he makes them watch it like loud on even louder volume yeah then he raises the volume and then he just starts raising the volume (laughs) and they're like what the fuck and i'm sitting here and i'm just like this is a reflection of our podcast when we do this show i'm the guys (laughs) asleep the whole time you two are high g fucking just turn up the volume forcing me to watch this goddamn shit (laughs) <laughs> and I was just like, this is too perfect. It was well. The oh funniest part God. for me was when Haiji was like looking at the video and he said, like, "Oh, it's really well edited," which to me is <laughs> like what Cat and I were be, would be saying about the show. Like the yeah. whole thing is like a microcosm of how like you view the show versus how like Cat right. and I view the show. It's really good. Um, <laughs> that, that is true. It's really well. well. Actually, that would be what you would say. You'd be like, "Yeah, it's oh, such really well great edited. animation." <laughs> like, and I'm asleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? He was just straight asleep. But I thought he was awake, but no. So anyway, yeah. um, in general, everybody's really starting to hit their stride in this episode, pun intended. Uh, the guys are noticeably more in shape. I'm sure Kat noticed this. Oh, yes. And- <laughs> like the shot of them, like shirtless, like with oh, slick yeah. with sweat. I'm like, yeah, this is what I wanted, bitches. <laughs> More. And like, they're noticeably getting like tans and stuff because they've been running outside in the sun so much. Like, uh, you see it in King's interview where they're they're like, "Wow, you're really tan." And he's like, "Well, I've been practicing a lot for the Hakone Ekiden." I really um, liked how they showed that the club is helping King in the interviews too, because he was so concerned with his interviews, and mm-hmm. like, it's kind of showing like it's it's working out for him. It's all going Definitely. all right. Yeah, and like Nico Chan, he gets on the scale and he's just like absolutely fucking ripped at this point. Oh my god, Nico is like one of the hottest dudes in this whole fucking <laughs> anime. He's like ripped as shit, and like his hair, holy fuck. <laughs> <laughs> also, they've been like selling his like weird little like nicotine nicotine dolls, mm-hmm. like apparently, and his making a Nico, profit. Nico dolls. Yeah, Nico, Nico, ni. That's been actually really adorable. Nico dolls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what cutesy name. Yeah. Mm. And so they're, they like, ask him to make more, which is ridiculous. But yeah. Um, also, it turns out that Musa's strength in running is uh, like on flat stretches where the others can't keep up with him. So like as we predicted at the beginning of the show, each of these people would be suited to like one part of the race more than others. Since the Hakone is broken up into different segments that have different like hills and flat areas and stuff. So Musa will obviously run like a flat stretch. Mm-hmm. Um and yeah, because like, yeah, you he, like, really good at the flats? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, like, Yuki points that out. Like, he's the one who notices it. And I'm like, Kakaru is like, wow, Yuki is, like, really good at, like, figuring that out. And, like, Haiji's like, yeah, he, I, that's why I made him a member of the team, because he's good with the scientific stuff. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so they do some, like, summer running. Several of them have their shirts off as they're running. And, like, Hanako and her dad are driving alongside in this truck and, like, She's just, like, tossing water at their face in regular intervals, like, to, like, keep them hydrated, I guess, or cool. Um, I felt like she probably enjoyed that way more than she should have. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. was funny. The See animations them all get of them the with, face. like, water on their face were a little weird, though. It's they, just, like, well, a yeah, they were just, like, still images. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, uh, <laughs> I don't know if that really checks out, dude. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, Haiji even goes to his doctor for like a check-in and like his doctor's like feeling his leg and saying like, wow, your muscles are like really growing and changing. Like basically his leg looks very strong after the injury. Like it's getting much better now. Mm -hmm. Um, And after like another pep talk from Haiji about how everything's coming together, like the guys like celebrate with like fireworks and streamers and uh, Hanako actually like talks to her dad briefly as they're watching fireworks. And she's like, it's kind of frustrating that, 
all she and her dad can do is just watch as these guys give their all. And she's gotten motivated, so she tells her dad that she wants to go to Kansei University. And he kind of gets, like, really emotional that she's, like, trying to do that. So that's cool. Um, at the end of the training camp, Haiji has them all go up to the peak of that mountain near the lake that they've been running around so much. Uh, to just, like, mark the end of everything with, like, an epic view. And Kakaru's like, well, this view means more to us because we're all here to see it together. Uh, very cheesy, but, you know, it's good. Um, so at their next meet, uh, King and Nico finally set their official record with like a 1627 time. And so everybody celebrates. And then like Prince is the last one who still has not broken through, but like, to my surprise, he's getting like really close. <laughs> like he's improved a ton, uh, with all of his teammates supporting him. And like, he finishes one race at like a 1740 and in another, like, even though it was raining at a 1718, I always so, ran better when it rained anyway, so... Oh, it cools you down and Yeah, it just keeps you cool, you. pulls the yeah. heat out of your skin, yeah. And so, like, he's at home, and he has a calendar on his door or something, and it's like, he's crossing off all the meats, and he looks at it, and he sees there is one meat left. It's September 23rd, and that is the last meat where he can make official time before the entry deadline for Hakone, which is October 1st. And so... That night, Prince goes out for a jog, and, like, Kakru wants to go with him, but he tells, like, Kakru, no, I'm going to go on my own. Don't worry about it. They do this, like, pretty awkward, like, joke with Musa, <laughs> which I think Leo had some thoughts on, where, like, he's in the bath, but he's in the bath, and it's completely dark, and so his black face is, like, hard to see in the dark, and so well, you just see his eyes pop out at Kakru and scare the shit out of him. Well, okay, which is, but like, it's, eh. it was a little awkward, but not, like, overly so, right? Yeah, I don't think it's, like super like bad or anything it's no, just like a little is, awkward this yeah. is actually a joke we used to play with uh my black friends like we'd go camping and stuff <laughs> and we'd be out there by the fire and we'd be like hey i can't see you man smile and open your eyes because <laughs> <laughs> well, like, it is a legitimate thing that it is harder to see someone yeah, with darker it's, skin it's, in it's the like dark us yeah. in the snow I mean, yeah, come on. exactly. exactly. <laughs> and like, and like, don't think we were being racist to our our friends. We were all assholes to each other. This is all we did all the time. I mean, this is nothing new. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was just like just a little like, gag. It's like when I go to like a place that has those glow in the dark lights, and my friends get to make fun of me because my skin is so white that it slightly glows under those lights. <laughs> there you, you know, go. It, it's just you get to you get to make the slight jokes as long as it's not too much. And I don't think they went crazy with it. It was very brief. <laughs> So. Yeah. yeah, the weirder thing to me was the conversation between them after that. Because, like, they're, Musa and Kakaru is sitting in the bath together. And Musa gets, like, really giggly and starts saying he's made a wonderful discovery during the races that, like, Kakaru wouldn't know about because he's always in front. And then Mo Musa says something about how it's, like, so wonderful to be young. And then he, like, catches, like, the light of the moon and some water in his hands in the bath. And he, like, giggles at that. And, like, Kakaru's just, like... What the fuck are you talking about, dude? <laughs> like, I'm in a bathtub naked with you. <laughs> yeah, I'm like really confused what that was supposed to be hinting towards, and they don't really like bring it around in this episode, at least. So I'm curious. I that whatever it is, if it went over my head, there I don't must know have been some Japanese symbolism that's kind of popular that we just aren't really familiar Kidding. with. Something about catching the moon and him being in front of them. You know, they're always trying to catch up to him or something like that. Be my only thing Quick I can guess. think of is that he's staring at their asses and he thinks it's wonderful. Like, that's literally the only thing I can think of. Uh, I don't know. That's the simplest explanation to me, but I don't know. We'll have to, have to wait and see. Um, so we fast forward and it is the 23rd of September and it's Prince's last chance to qualify. And everybody's supporting him. And like though Haiji is like standing far away from the rest of the guys and like that great runner from earlier in the show, Fujioka, comes up. And asks him, like, hey, why aren't you standing by Prince? He's, like, the last guy who needs to make it. Uh, do you not want to, like, pressure him or something? And Haiji says, like, he'll feel that pressure no matter where I am. Like, how much time do you think we've spent together? Like, he knows exactly how I feel. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just that Haiji is separated from everybody else because, like, this is a really emotional moment for him. Because this is, like, do or die for his dream for these this group of people. And so... Prince asks his teammates, like, if you have something to, like, say to me, like, write it on my arm as motivation. That's a pretty good idea. That was, yeah. I, I thought that was a good idea. It's like a way in, for him to Yeah, and then while he's running, he can just glance down at it and get the, you know, a little extra. 
Yeah, yeah. I, thought, needs. I thought they were going to write it on his hand and he was going to have his hand out in front like he was reading his manga. But, oh, uh, yeah. yeah. But even so, good. just writing it on his like left forearm, he can glance down at it and like they write the word forward. And so like as he's like gunning like that last like stretch of the race and like he sees that word and like he, he imagines like their faces looking back at him and he just like guns it and like screams basically in determination across the final stretch and he like is exhausted and he looks back at the clock and it's like 1626 1627 so he made it by like four seconds and so he and then like it was also smart to use that because he raises his left arm in the air and it has forward you know written on it and then like everybody's cheering and then Haiji is like looking down at him and he just breaks into tears because his dream finally came true like who would have imagined that fucking Prince could run a 1630 at the beginning of the show? It's I'm insane. I'm still not convinced. <laughs> it was epic. His, his okay. form yeah. still sucks. It, but like, it's so much better than his form at the beginning. And like, this is why I think that this anime is such a good anime. Like mm-hmm. that scene was so fucking inspiring. Yeah, like it really holy was. shit! And it just make like when you see shit like that in this anime, it makes you feel like you can do anything. Like mm-hmm. I have moments after this where I'm like, yeah. I'm going to go do that thing that I don't really want to do because I can do it. And, like, I know that's cheesy or whatever, but, like, that's a nice thing to get out of an anime. And it's not just, like, Prince's journey. It's, like, all of their journeys for me. Exactly. Like, especially, yeah. like, seeing all these guys in, like, and like how far they've come and how, like, I don't know, like, they think Joji and Jota are talking at one point in the show just being, like, we're really running now. Like, we're really doing it. And, like... It's like living that moment of self improvement is something that like I always have to remind myself to like try to strive for because I get so complacent. Whether it's like working out or like you know going for like a new job or like through school, like I have to remind myself that like it sucks while you're doing it. It is the fucking worst. But like afterwards, after you've worked really hard, you get that sense of like fulfillment, and it's like oh, there's nothing better than that. Well, and, and it gets to be less sucky as you go along. Like, yeah. at first it does suck, but then as you continue to do something, like, you, you start to like it. You start to enjoy it. So Exactly. Then you see that with this. I don't know. I, I like that inspiration that you get from shows like this. I know Leo's sitting there going, nah, and, like, throwing popcorn, but whatever. Fuck you, Leo. Well, I don't think Leo had that much bad stuff to say about this episode, actually. I think Leo kind of liked this episode. Honestly. Oh, did you? Tell us, Leo. Hmm? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Moving uh, on. Kamari Kusa, Leo, tell us about it. Oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, thanks for the perfect setup. You're so, welcome. Kimari, <laughs> Kimari uh-huh. Kusa, episode three. Kat, did you watch this? Maybe. I like scrolled it. I was I, unbelievable. I like, I like barely paid attention. I watched it while I was watching, t- while I was making dinner. How about that? I'll tell you. Mm. Oh, God. So, anyways, they continue their journey to Island 2 while repairing the tracks along the way. Um, Ritsu is, like, still... Meh. Ritsu is still doubting herself <laughs> after what seems like some decisions, like, had... Some decisions she had made in the past had gone wrong. It may have result, resulted in, like, some deaths, which they have been hinting at a little bit already. Yeah. Uh, and then Wakaba asked about the tracks. Rin explains to him... Or... Rina. Rina one does. of the Rinas. <laughs> <sighs> explains to him how that they they built all the tracks and they are amazing uh, <laughs> for doing so. Uh, they eventually come to the end of the tracks and have to do some like traveling across the ground. They eventually come to like a blue wall that's supposed to be like the boundaries between the islands for the most part and then they get on some like more tracks. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they make it to Island 2 and it's uh, apparently it's a theme park and you figured out what theme park it was, right? Yeah, it's uh, Space World, which is in, like, southwestern Japan in, like, Fukuoka Prefecture. It's in the city of Kita, Kyushu, and it was closed, actually, like, this January 1st, it closed down. So it's funny that they're using it, like, as, like, a post-apocalyptic, like, hellscape or whatever, because it's, it's, you know, it's going to stand there for a while, probably, before it gets demolished. And, like, I've really been liking the backgrounds, but... This one like really stands out more because it has that theme park background. So like you see like a space shuttle in the background <laughs> yeah. next to a loop from a roller coaster. It's it's, it's pretty interesting, you know, and all post apocalyptic. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they get to the theme park and they stop when the oldest sister like starts having a coughing fit. She doesn't look that well. Uh, they the girls also use something they call I Chan that can tell them if there's water on the island. There's none there, and they also know that there is none on Island Three. So they're hoping Island Four has some. Uh, the girls then drink some water like to replenish their red leaves on the inside. 
and it looks like they have to drink like a gallon or two, but then they're good for like 10 days. Like, yeah, they're like st- camels or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then it turns out two of the arenas has snuck off to eat metal because that's how they duplicate themselves. Uh, they eventually get found by Ritsu and Wakaba, and Wakaba can also see the leaves inside them that keeps them alive. And the other thing that they use to duplicate whatever mm-hmm. that was, it was just like a it's like a pink leaf or there's, something. Yeah. See, there's just too many weird things in this anime. Like now people have leaves in them. Now people are. What do you mean metal. now? They've had them since episode well, one. I know, but it's weird. Like it, <laughs> it doesn't we, make sense. I don't we know. know they're not it human. Me. Yeah, they're not human. Obviously, that's part of the the mystery yeah. of the show is figuring out who these people are, which we found out a little bit more this episode. I don't think they're ever going to explain it to us. Well, they like, explained satisf- a lot in this episode. But, like, yeah, not, I don't know. <laughs> so Ritsu is still trying to figure out wh- why she keeps like getting hot and her heart racing and stuff. Oh, uh, it's so cute. She likes him, but she doesn't know she likes it. I don't know. Right, which goes to show her she's her non-human nature. She doesn't know she's ever been told these things. Uh, mm. Wakaba asks about seeing any other people, and they just say the first person who died. Right, they they only know of the first person who died right as they were born. This yeah, little who mystery they there. call like the first person, the first capital person, F, yeah. capital P. Yeah. Interestingly, they also tell Wakaba he isn't human because his blood is red. So I'm yeah. guessing they are the ones that think they are human when they actually Aren't. are not. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then Wakaba like finds some more of the colors, uh, Kimuru Kusa, and by the smell of smell of it, eats it and finds it edible. So I guess it's like lettuce or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and like Ritsu is confused because she doesn't know what he meant by smell. So another uh, sign that uh, you know they we know they're not human, but just more stuff like that. Yeah, but they were also like surprised he could see the like the red fog earlier, which was weird. Mm-hmm. I don't know, just like all these weird little hints about how they're different from him. Yeah, and back at the train car, the oldest sister gives Wakaba like an old yellow faded Kimurakusa that doesn't glow anymore, and it causes them to talk about two other sisters named Riku and Ryoku who are not with them anymore. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, there's an earthquake, and like the ground opens up and starts tilting the train train car and they have like this conductor's hat that has like a bunch of these faded kimurukusas in it and it goes tumbling out and then like okaba jumps out after it and then Richa, ritsu jumps after him and the oldest uses the tree like to pull them back in mm-hmm. uh, and all we know right now is that it is very important to them and at the end okaba sees one of the leaves in the hat start to glow red again yeah so, that like fades into the ed and I, yeah, so I just think it's like it is like the deceased, like Riku or Ryoko or yeah. and all, anybody else who came before who they are just like keeping around. I believe yeah. so also. And if you notice in the ED, it has the outlines of like uh, mm. two more. And so, yeah, so and, and which is interesting because Wakaba must have some type of power to recharge these leaves because the he recharged that blue leaf, didn't he? From the one I episode, so. was it a blue one? Some other leaf. He, he, he somehow charged it. We don't know how. And this time he did it again. But this time he got really close to the red fog. So I wondered if that had anything to do with it. It I could, yeah. And so, yeah, we know that like Riku, who is one of the sisters who died, apparently, would also had that power to make the Kimuri Kusa glow. Um, yeah, so they introduced this concept of like this first person who they were born from initially and who like created like the Renas and stuff and I wonder if that was like some type of like scientist or something like who wanted to create a life form that could like recover after this, like whatever disaster created the red fog, like whatever catastrophic oh, yeah. event happened. It's possible that it's that or I, I don't know. But then like the question is like, what the fuck is Wakaba and where did he come from then? Yeah. Like that's the next big question. Yeah. I love all these mysteries and yeah. the it's doing a really good job of giving me enough information every episode that like, I'm so I'm so like want to find out what happens so much. Yeah. <laughs> and cat give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> like it's just so much weird. Like cat said there's like a whole bunch of weird imagery, but it's kind of fun for me to like try to piece it you together know, and see what Kat, it means. Cat just wants answers and she wants answers right fucking now. <laughs> yeah. I mean that's that's cat. <laughs> well, well it would suck. Like, yeah. I don't like oh, not knowing like how things are working. Like it, I don't know. And it would suck if we got to the end of the show and it was just like, oh, we're not going to give you any answers. Ha ha. Yeah, that it feels suck. like there's just too many like things that they can't explain them all, right? Mm-hmm. 
Like too many weird things. I don't know. And I just don't like the idea of like, ooh, everything in the world is unknowable and we'll give you little tiny hints, but you're never going to really understand. Like, I don't know. But it it is more interesting than I first thought. It's just still annoying to me. (laughs) Okay. Okay. I'll continue to watch it. I'll I'll give it a fair (laughs) try. I'll try not to be so negative on it. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Okay. So you guys got anything else to say? No, nah, uh, that's it. You can move on. All right. Okay. So, Promise Neverland, episode three. Did they give this a title? Yes, yes. it's 1A1045. Oh. Oh, that's right. This is the one where all of the titles are like numbers, which yes. I was like, what is this? Like, I can't. <laughs> that's, that was a weird decision. I, I didn't look part. into it, but I'm guessing it's somebody's code that's on their neck if you looked. Yeah, but no one is going to like, I don't know. It's It's a little odd, but whatever. Okay. Okay. So at the beginning of the episode, you find out, like, I think at the end of the last episode, they also introduced her. Um, but basically, Crone, the new nanny, um, is moving in. She's like moving into this room in between a bunch of the other rooms. Um, and, Re- and they like go downstairs and have this meeting, the three of them. And Ray points out that, that having this new nanny is, is maybe a good thing because she's like a potential new source of information that they can figure out more stuff from her. And he and Norman also point out that like Carol, the baby that she brought with her um, is a, is it being brought as a replacement for Connie is good. Cause they can try to get information off the baby. Right. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And they also wonder like where they get the little babies that they bring, like the one year olds. Yeah. Because they, it oh, was last ahead. episode I brought up. There's like, so they must have a breeding farm somewhere or something like that, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So they kind of discuss that. They're like, okay, so are, are there just farms of like breeding, and then they bring them here? Like, how does it work? Um, and they're also wondering, like, well, there, there's these adults that obviously don't get eaten. Like, are, do they? How do they come about? Like, do they always? Are they always obedient, or have they been captured? Is are there's a reason that they're forced to be obedient? Like, they have a lot of questions. Um. And then they kind of discuss, like, well, how are they tracking us? Because they know from the last episode that they're, a- they're able to find them. Like, they have tracking on each of the kids, but they don't know what kind of device it is and where it is on them. Um, so they decide to check the baby, Carol, since she just got her tracking device, probably. So and they're going to, like, see if they can find a mark on her to give them a clue where the fuck it would be. Um, so, yeah. And then they switch to this scene with crone and isabella in the room by themselves and apparently isabella is the youngest to be selected as a caretaker and has raised like the highest number of high quality plants as they call them (laughs) um and crone looks up to her she she's almost like she's asked to memorize all the kids names like right now And, and isabella comments that like it will be easier than getting the top score every day. And this combined with what Isabella said, like she didn't ask for Crone in particular earlier in the conversation. And then Crone said that she was happy to be back on the, on this side. Mm -hmm. It made me think that she used to be a kid at this orphanage. Could definitely be. Yeah. And like a high quality one, because she says like, it'll be better than getting the top score every day. It'll be easier. Yeah, I, wanna, oh, like, I didn't make that connection. Interesting. Yeah, I want to theorize that about about that a little bit because I think Leo and I also had the same kind of complaint that like, man, they let these kids like learn so much shit that they shouldn't be learning if they if they want to like just raise them as cattle, right? Like mm-hmm. uh, that like Ray knows about like radio waves, like how the hell would he even know about that unless they allowed him or like taught him about it? Right. And so the thing I thought was okay, maybe the most intelligent of the kids are told the truth and then turned into like moms or something else on the other side. But they're uh, supposed to be back. the tastiest ones. Why? Yeah, that's maybe why I'm sometimes, confused. Yeah, maybe I don't know. sometimes they don't harvest them. Like sometimes they're like, well, we're going to keep this one. We need another caretaker. But most of the time they harvest them. I don't know. Yeah, they're, they must offer them something. Um, and then some probably agree and some don't or like some just like, can't do it i don't know but i'm sure we'll find out more of like that whole breakdown but that made it a little bit clearer to me like okay why they're raising these kids to be like fast and like smart and all of these things 
So Yeah, it made me wonder if that was what was going on for sure. So then Isabella tells the cr- crone like that two of the kids know and and she's going to Apparently Isabella's supposed to report this and like immediately kill them, but she doesn't want to cuz she wants to cover up her mistake. Mm-hmm. And later Crone is talking is talking in a mirror by herself. As if she's talking to someone else. Oh, she's fucking batshit crazy. She's got that, like, (laughs) doll, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like, either she is batshit insane, or there was someone on the other side of the mirror, but her talking to the doll makes me think she's probably just batshit insane. Yeah, I think she's she's, a little nuts. There was nobody on the other side of that mirror. She's nuts. Yeah. So, like, she talks to this mirror as if she's like, oh... Like, she talks about the situation with Isabella, and she's like, hmm, I think I'm going to play along to get Isabella's favor so I can get promoted. But then she goes on to the baby doll and, like, is talking about how great it would be to be a mama. And, like, what do you guys think the mama position is, and how is it different from the caretaker position? Oh, no, it is the caretaker. I think yeah, they call the, the caretaker thing. mom as well. Um, I don't know. So I think they might be different. I think they might think be so? two different. Like, I think the mama position is, like, a promotion. But maybe that's maybe, maybe that's okay. Me. No, if you look at the uh, if you bring up Isabella, it says Isabella is the mama of the Grace Field House. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah that's what it, she wants to take over, like a house, like her position, mom, like yeah. Isabella yeah, has basically. Yeah. Uh, and then, I, oh, go ahead. yeah, I just want to say for a second, I don't think uh, Crone has a chance in hell to outsmart Isabella. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. I would agree with that. Um, then okay, so then Crone like changes her mind and like she starts throwing this doll around like violently in a way that like no baby would really survive, <laughs> like yeah. like hitting it against things and like tossing it up into the ceiling and shit. And I'm like, holy fuck! And she decides that she's instead going to capture the kids and report them and get Isabella fired so she can take her job. But she's gonna play around until then. And I'm like. Okay. Uh. As she's like dancing around the room, she has like a wooden floor, right? And they like mm-hmm. really accentuate how loud her footsteps are. And it's something I noticed like later in the episode when they're playing tag. Like, Isabella is like a big, powerful woman, <laughs> like, she, which makes her even a bit more scary to contend with for the little kids. Like, yeah. 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 But. So then they f- they switch to Emma's point of view again, and she's checking Carol for that device, like the little baby, and she can't see anything. And she checks, like, every inch on this baby's body. And she thinks to herself, like, the device must be easily removable so that the demons won't have to eat it. And while she's thinking this, Gilda asks her about the night Connie died and just seems, like, kind of off. And then suddenly Emma realizes, like, oh, it has to be in the ear where Isabella told her once that, like, the babies get checked for diseases. Like, they take some blood, she said, I think. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And as Emma bends down and promises, like, I'm going to protect you, Carol, Gilda has this, like, sinister look on her face with her glasses oh, all I just shined had, up had this thought that like apparently they didn't have the medical book in there and how the basics of drawing blood <laughs> it's oh, not yeah. in your ear you wouldn't take it in your ear yeah like i, I don't think your ear would have very much, especially not the tip of your ear because isn't that like no. cartilage so there wouldn't yeah. be any blood you, there that, well there's there's still blood but it's yeah it's cartilage it'd be very hard to draw from it's very very small veins <laughs> yeah um Medical knowledge, Leo. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but yeah, like what the? Okay, I don't like how they make Gilda seem very sinister in a lot of these scenes because she's fucking ten. Like how si- how <laughs> sinister can a ten year old be? You just got to do the uh, that uh, mirror effect on the glasses, and you'll make anybody evil. <laughs> I guess, but like, come on. I don't know. Anyway, so you get this scene where Isabella gets called by someone called Grandma. And she asks Isabella to confirm that that the three best stock can be sent out on schedule for something called the Tefari, which I'm assuming is like some sort of ritual or party that's coming up that the demons have. It seems Um, like it's like the numero uno monster guy. Whoever it sounds like. Whoever they refer to as him. It seems like a spiritual offering almost to like their yeah. god or their leader or their god leader. Yeah, because yeah. like him, apparently someone really important, and that's who they're going to be fed to. But I think that Tafari is like some sort of event to appease yeah. him. That's come- yeah. So yeah. apparently Isabella always has like the best stock and all the other farms that exist produce like subpar stock. At least um, this year, yeah. 
Yeah. And then, so it's very important that they have these children. Ooh. Uh, and then <laughs> Gilda is paying a lot of fucking attention to Emma the next day. Um, and, and Emma's, like, going to meet Ray and Norman. And I almost wonder if she, like, followed them. And is in the bushes because there's a lot of like shots in that scene. I felt like that. Yeah. I definitely yeah. felt like that. Like first, the shots from within the both bushes were just still, but then there was a third shot where it the camera was like moving around, like there is a person looking mm-hmm. through those bushes. So it's either yep. Gilda or somebody else. It, it's very likely Gilda, though. I don't know. But yeah, so she she meets up with Ray and Norman, and she tells them like I found out where the trackers are. And they decide that they won't be able to take them out without it being noticeable. And they're going to have to wait until they're leaving before they can destroy them. And Ray promises, like, I'm going to figure out how to destroy them best. Like, leave that to me. Um, and then they all, like, they're, they're trying to strategize, right? They're like, how are we going to get the others to go with us? Like, they all trust Isabella. Like, they're, they're going to have to somehow lie to them or something. And then some of the kids aren't very good ability wise, like, and some are babies, so it's going to be really hard to get all of them out. Um, right. And they decide, like, well, we need to train these kids while pretending to play tag. And they do this montage where like Ray and Norma or Norman and and um, Emma are like trying to teach these kids like different techniques with like hiding themselves and all this while playing tag and it's a pretty good montage i, I think. want to call no. bullshit on the part where they're like oh we can train them by playing tag and i'm like the adults would know something's up well, well they, they would they notice do. something's off they'd be like uh. <laughs> it's maybe. true but like maybe they want them to be good at tag because like it's like, like you know look crone is really good at tag as we see like yeah. a little bit later well, yeah and back to the thing like making them so smart to be good, but then why would you include books that they had to learn somewhere how to do tracking and cover-up skills? I mean, that's a very yeah. specific book. Why is this <laughs> in your library? I, was, I don't know. I need and, more explanation on this like like later as well. Like I have like our, my theory about it, like that they want these kids to be capable like in case they get chosen. But also like, yeah, I want more clarification on that yeah, 100%. And, and I just want to say, you know, the show really makes you think and that aspect makes it work against it because I think if it wasn't such a think heavy show, mm-hmm. it may have not have had that thought. <laughs> right, right, right. But I'm like, man, if I was having a farm, I don't, I would make sure the tracking and cover up skills weren't <laughs> book wasn't <laughs> in there. <laughs> it's like, let's, let's not give them knowledge to escape. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, but yeah, so at one point, Crone like wants to play tag with everyone, with her being it. And I, I was not sure about her motives. Like, if she was trying to be like, listen, bitches, you can't hide from me, or, like, what her motive there was. I think it's just part of her sad- sadistic side also, showing them, you know, who's boss. Maybe, yeah. I feel like at this point, the the kids should really have played like they were dumber than they were. Like, they all, like, sincerely try to outdo her. And if it was me, I would have been like, oh, no, you caught me. And, like play dumber than i am so that she's doesn't think i'm smart you know Mm -hmm. um but anyway you do find out that crone has her own tricks like she's pretty smart like you you find out she kind of like leaves these leaves for the little kids to catch them because they're interested and they come look um and you also find out that crone is fucking athletic like she's big but she also can run like Damn, she like almost catches Emma, and Emma's carrying like two kids. Um. Oh, and then okay, I thought this was one of the most interesting parts of this episode. She mentions the harvest and like wonders if Emma saw it, and she like does that right as she looks Emma in her face to see like if it, Emma saw it, right? So like she definitely mm. knows now that Emma is one of the kids that knows. Okay. That that was really ingenious on her part. I thought. Well, she immediately thought that the three smartest kids are the ones that probably figured it out. So. Well, but but remember, Isabella told her two kids know. So she yeah. she thinks only two of them know. So she thinks Emma's one of them and is wondering which of the other two know, probably. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know. She says something as she catches Emma. She says, like, if you did see the harvest, I'm on your side, which I thought was interesting because it's probably a lie. But, like, it might be a twist, right, in the plot. Like, ooh, but she's actually on their side. Like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's interesting. 
And that noise when she catches Emma was fucking good, you have to admit. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> good yeah. suspense, yeah. Like you and said. Then, yeah. But the, she doesn't catch Norman or Ray. Like, time runs out. Um, I don't know. And then at the very end, they talk about how there's possibly a traitor watching for Isabella among them, like one of the kids. <laughs> like, um, I don't know. And this obviously seems like it's Gilda. But it seems they definitely too, want us to think it's Gilda, yeah, which seems, makes me it think it's too not. Easy. Exactly, yeah, it's way too exactly, easy. Exactly. Yeah. I was like, it's way too easy. So like, what the fuck's going on with Gilda if she's not the spy? Because like, it is too easy. Uh, it's interesting. This show has a lot of like, mm, it could be this, but they could be fucking with us and it could actually be this. I, and I like that. I like having mm-hmm. to theorize. Um, but yeah, so at the end of this episode, knowing everything we know, what do we think about Crone? Is she crazy? Um, did she used to be a kid at the orphanage and could she actually be on, on the kid's side or was that all just bullshit? I think she's probably just, she's mostly in it for herself. I could see the kids like turning her to their side against Isabella, Mm -hmm. especially if the kids make her believe that like she'll get to become a mom because of it. Mm -hmm. Um, like if she takes down Isabella, she would take over the, the whole orphanage or the whole farm. Um, the other thing about Crone, which like some people have been talking about, is man, like especially when they make her look evil, they often make her look oddly close to racist caricatures of black people in oh, the past. I, I kept thinking that she looks a lot like Aunt Jemima on the yeah. Jemima bottle. <laughs> like they make her mouth oh, like God. hugely wide and like her lips huge and her eyes like crescented, and it's just it looks a lot like whenever people do draw like racist caricatures of black people, so that's like the thinking- go-to. If Crone was in an orphanage at one time, what did she do to become, you know, special enough not to be eaten? And it made me wonder if she was in a similar situation as Gilda. And that's what earned her her position. Oh. Oh, she like that, tattled on somebody who yeah. was trying to escape. Yeah. Maybe that's why she was smirking at Gilda. Because like she used hmm. to be Gilda. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely saw that too. Cause like the, I feel like the last few seasons, they've like Japan has done its best to add more African American characters like in shows. Yeah. I've noticed that, and they've been animating them better. Like especially, um, well, this is from a run- manga. When was this manga put out? Uh, I don't know. Initially, 2014 or something. I don't know. <clears throat> I'll look. It okay, up. well, that's recent enough. Yeah, but especially recently, like with Run with the Wind, like they, you you see some 16. black characters that are like actually pretty well animated, which yeah. didn't used to happen. Um, so <laughs> yeah, for, for to, to go from that and then go to this was a little bit like mm, like could have done better. <laughs> Um, yeah, so yeah, 2016 for this manga. And it's just like, I don't know. I, I still think Crone is a really interesting character. So I'm going to oh, like overlook is. the design aspect. It's just like, even with Musa, like we noticed like some weird stuff today, just like a little bit weird, like in, in past episodes. It's like Japan still has like a long way to go in portraying oh, but the, people. But they are getting like, better. And I'll always give them props when they <laughs> improve. Yeah. So Making like decent strides, I guess. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, so, and then what do we think? Do we think that Gilda is a plant? Do we think it's a misdirect? I think it's a misdirect. I think there is a traitor, I think. I think Ray's right. But who is that traitor is a very interesting question. We'll hmm. have to find out. I think it'll be someone... I don't think it's someone... like that little tiny... It's funny, like, right when they said, like, there's a traitor, they showed that, like, little tiny kid in the hallway, and I was like, okay, it better not be him. Oh, He's, like, Phil. three. I think it's yeah. Phil. <laughs> I was like, Actually, come on. I think, it, I think it may be one of, like, the least likely person we suspect, and it'll be that Isabella lied to them, right? It could be, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, with that said, uh, let's take a break and listen to a word from our fellow podcasters. Yeah, see you in a minute. Hey. Hey. Do you like wrestling? Whether it be in a bar, an arena, some weird place in Asia, or in a stadium. Or the occasional penis plex. Well, if any of these things might tickle your fancy, anywhere in between from penises to wrestling, you can come and check out our podcast. Our podcast name is Smack It Down. We talk all things WWE, New Japan, anything else in between. I'm Jay Silver. I'm Corey Gold. And we look forward to you joining us. Happy Rusev Day. Happy Rusev Day, indeed. Here's a slimy pizza we found in the garbage. Yeah, they're going to go to the park late at night. 
Nothing wrong could happen there. Nothing bad ever happens Come at on, the Japan. parkway tonight. It's Japan. It's safe there. Yeah, sure. Safe. The tentacle monsters only come out in your bedroom at night. Um, you haven't watched a whole lot of hentai, have you? No, <laughs> I have They catch you at school, too. <laughs> <laughs> you can find the Trash Pandas Watch Anime podcast on FaceTube, uh, Ubook, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and iTunes, and on Twitter at Trash Panda Anime. Oh, we also have a website, tpwapodcast.com. Hi, I'm JD, your host of the Red Leaf Retrocast, your best location to learn, remember, and relive the past to the present. Our podcast has four shows for you to listen to between retro gaming, modern gaming, anime, and even wrestling. The Retro Gaming Cast covers discussion topics, and each episode we discuss retro games picked based on a decided theme for that episode, ranging from space all the way to console specials like the old handheld Game Boy. Our modern gaming cast is monthly and covers video game titles that were released in that previous month. Each anime cast, we focus to review a retro anime each and every episode, like the original Mobile Suit Gundam to the racing hit Initial D. But that's not all. We also keep up with the seasonal shows by occasionally doing impressions and reviews as well. Finally, our last show is about wrestling, where we keep the rising indie scene up to date while also covering shows from the bigger promotions like Ring of Honor, New Japan, and WWE, so we cover it all. We also cover a retired wrestler every episode in what we call the Wrestler Spotlight and are currently on a quest covering old WCW Thunder episodes from the late 90s, every cast. So if any one of those casts sound like something you'd like to check out, that's the Red Leaf Retrocast Gaming, Anime, and Wrestling, found at iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, and all your favorite podcasting sites. Also, you can learn, remember, and relive the past to the present. We can't wait to see you soon. And we're back. Buongiorno. And Leo. <laughs> <laughs> Leo, what do you have for us today? Oh my god. He's talking oh, about shit. JoJo. <laughs> Holy shit. We're gonna get complaints from Italian fans. Yeah, from me. <laughs> this, this is not this is not how we speak. God damn it. We're aware of this. We're, yeah, we're just, just being Also be aware assholes. I'm going to butcher a lot of names. But yeah, I'm we have here our, as we the have official our Italian here. pronunciation <laughs> are, you, are you the Italian mediator? Is that what you are? This is, this is going to be fun, though. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, God, the two hardest names. So, Pucciate and Posciuto. <laughs> So wait, what, what episode is this? Let's let the people know. <laughs> <laughs> episode 16 of JoJo, the Golden thankful Wind. Death part two. The I thankful was death part caught two. up in just going ahead and saying their names wrong. Okay, and, and let me just say, for for Ham, like, Prosciutto's pretty hot. Prosciutto's like, I don't great. like Ham. I, I really don't like Ham. Mm-hmm. So, like, but, like, he's he's sexy. Especially if you wrap some Prosciutto him. around melon. Oh, it's very good. Very, Ooh, very melon. Good. Melon? Yeah, like cantaloupe, melon and cantaloupe meat? melon, and prosciutto. Yep, that's, that's disgusting. No, it's not. Oh. It's delicious. Trust me. Like that sweetness and saltiness. It's like a very Italian like delicacy, but it's it's really good. So, anyways, those two go flying out of the train to their almost certain death <laughs> until <laughs> I can do this one. Pesci finally hey. does something smart and uses his stand to hook pro, uh, prosciutto's hand. So wait, where is? What is this train? Why are they on this train? And where are they going? <laughs> so this is the second. This was in the episode before that. Is all these questions mm-hmm. you're asking me? Yeah, I know, but like the our audience has no idea because we just picked this up. So like. okay, so like all these bitches have to take care of this girl who's the daughter of their boss's boss's fucking boss, right? Mm-hmm. Trish and like he told them to go get this fucking key so that he can we they can use this magical vehicle to get them to him so he can pick up his fucking bitch daughter and they can go on their way <laughs> so they go through this whole ordeal to try and fucking find the key and they almost die and then they find the key and they're like shit we can't figure out what the key goes to because of course he didn't fucking tell them what the key goes to he's just like you will understand or some bullshit <laughs> which like 
No, you should tell them. These are the people actually doing the job you want them to do. This isn't like uh, some mystical Lion King bullshit. Or like, we're not in Pocahontas. This, this is a real life situation. Mm. So anyway, they figure out that it's the turtle. Yeah, it is like the a key. huge key sized like shape in its back. <laughs> yeah, they, they're supposed to stick the key in the turtle, which is frankly animal cruelty. What the fuck did they do to that turtle <laughs> to dig that thing into its fucking shell? The, God knows no, that turtle's cat, been through some shit. The key is it, what's the, key the truth. Is the turtle stand? Uh huh. Uh huh. What the fuck did they do to the turtle to give it a stand? They probably tortured it. <laughs> they shot it with a the fucking arrow. That's how everybody gets a <laughs> stand. Torture. That's right. Animal cruelty. I told you. <laughs> anyway, so they stick the freaking key in the freaking turtle shell, and they hide inside the turtle. And, and then now they're on a train like, from Napoli to up to, I guess, eventually Venice. But like, yeah. So yeah. to be clear, they're on a train in a turtle on their way to Venice. And, I guess. Yeah, and prosciutto has been using his stand. Uh, that causes everybody to age very rapidly. Mm-hmm. And it's mm-hmm. just fucking everybody up and they're in this terrible situation. And basically that episode ends with uh, Pusciati basically unzipping the side of the train and taking uh, prosciutto with him. <laughs> well, no, no. Okay, so first, if we're really recapping, like, First, Bucciardi or whatever the fuck. Just call I can't him say Bruno, his name. You, you goddamn Midwesterners. <laughs> I can't say his name. Yeah, do Bruno All is his say name. Is so say Bucciardi. Bruno. Is that, I know that's a butchery. I know. Okay. <laughs> anyway, he's like, listen, Mista. Go and like take care of these bitches for us because we're all dying in here and all we have is this like little bit of ice. By the way, the ice counteracts the like aging process. Just a little somehow. bit. Somehow. Yeah, because so, they wanted it like, to only affect men, not women. And women are at, like a slightly cooler body temperature, I guess, because they have more fat or something they explain. No, that what, it's not intentional. They just figured that out because Trish was aging slower than everybody else. Oh, I thought it was intentional. Oh, okay. No, <laughs> because then later on, Pesci's just like chomping on some ice, ice at the bar so he doesn't age. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I don't know. I, I thought it was intentional as well. Who knows? Anyway, so... Like, Mista goes, he's like, all right, we're going to do this. I'm going to get him. Like, okay, 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 wait. It's, I, it, there's no way it could be potential because it straight up shows a scene with the mother dying and the child, like, going, mommy, mommy. So, like, there, there's, it's only, they just figure out there's a temperature difference. It's just some weird okay. rule to his stand. That's okay, all it funny. is. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe. But, um, yeah, anyway, so Mista goes, is like, I'm going to get these bitches and, like, almost. Like, tries to take out um, Pesci. Uh, Pesci and, like, almost gets there. Well, and, and Prosciutto. Um, and then gets, like, shot three times in the fucking face. Mm-hmm. And, like, you think he's dead. And then you find out, like, oh, but he's not dead because one of his bullets, like, number six. saved his ass. <laughs> yeah, blocks all no, I think all it's the number bullets. five, wasn't it? The one who gets bullied all the time. No, it was number six. It's the one that's also need, with. Oh, okay, we're going back for video evidence because I'm pretty sure it was number five, <laughs> the one who gets his ass whooped all the time. So I was like, oh, look, he remembered. <laughs> I don't know which one it was. I don't oh remember. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm going to go back and I'm going to watch and I'm going to be like, eat my shit, Leo. It was five. <laughs> you just wait. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Anyway, so after Mista failed, they go because they figured out that like they must be in the the driver's cabin from where Misa appeared. So they go back to the driver's cabin and they're like, hmm, what's in here? Ooh, look, we found a turtle. And they're about to get them all. And so Bushyarti or whatever the fuck his name is, like comes out of the turtle and like is going to ambush them. And and then like kind of ambushes them and they fight some. And then that's when this episode starts. So there, there's your fucking recap. <laughs> Now go. What go. a recap! I mean, I was was always under the impression that uh, our viewers were either listen, watching it if they wanted to or not. So, well, you know what? But now, now the ones who aren't like they know they they get the situation. So, anyways, they understand the two are hurtling okay. through the air outside the train, and uh, fucking Pesci finally does the smart thing and uses a stand the hook uh, prosciutto's hand 
and like, but Bruno's like still holding on and he uses his stand to swing at uh, prosciutto. And since he is still weak from the aging, prosciutto thinks he dodged it, but Bruno is actually aiming for the line and that causes it to switch to his hand. And then prosciutto just like falls away and there's a giant blood splatter. And then Bruno and Pesci both kind of realize that n- everybody's still aged. So prosciutto must still be alive since the aging hasn't been reversed. And they both kind of find it, eventually find him like tucked up under the train, but he's a fucking mangled mess. And he's, they flat out like, Oh, he, he can't, he can't survive these injuries. Um, and this causes a uh, Pesci to suddenly become like a hard ass. Like he has like this revelation, you know, like, Oh, prosciutto. He never let his stand up in the end and all that stuff. Oh, I see that shit. I just sent vi- ah! I just sent Leo video evidence that what it is bitch, number five. It was five. <laughs> Eat my shit, Leo. I, it, told you. I think it's both of them, I honestly. Because yeah, there's think- three bullets they have to block. So cause like uh, bullet six shows up with some ice <laughs> later too. Oh, is it six well, then no, who is but on it's five that came out of yes, his fucking head? It's five and who saved comes out ass. of his head. It's okay, like, so oh, then is alive. it six that's with Bruno and he has the ice then? Yes, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah that's, that's what, I was, what I was thinking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I was <laughs> anyways, that's you know right. Pesci has his stupid revelation. So <laughs> like they do like <laughs> some wrangling with his fish hook trying to get trying to like buck uh Bruno off, but he eventually manages to get back inside the train and then he starts unzipping his body parts, but Pesci just keeps hooking him in anyways. Mm-hmm. So Bruno finally like unzips himself into like a ton of smaller pieces and it causes Pesci not to be able to find him because he's looking for like a human sized body with his hook. He's sensing all this with his hook. Uh and then, like, he's getting close to his heart, and he's afraid he's going to uh, detect his heartbeat. So he ends up splitting his heart, which causes it to stop. Uh, and he's just waiting, basically, for Pesci to go. up. Eventually, Pesci does, but he's... Uh, but then Bruno's, like, really weak from his heart, not being it. It looks like he's not going to make it. But then, like, Pesci just starts throwing this temper tan- tantrum in the cabin and actually hits the brakes, which causes all his body parts to slide together, and he manages to put himself back together just in time and like bullet six is like freaking out he's like yeah the bullet, the, i mean mista is basically my favorite character because his stand is the most humorous out of the all of them sex pistols <laughs> the sex called. pistols yeah at least well not on crunchyroll there's a lot of stuff they can't call the actual name on crunchyroll because of uh, licensing concerns like yeah this episode it's called the thankful death Instead of the Grateful Dead, like even if you listen right. to the dialogue, they they say Grateful Dead out loud, but they have to subtitle yeah. it Thankful Death. It's yeah, pretty and I funny. noticed on Crunchyroll they were calling Prosciutto's stand something else than what it really was, which is a, another band I can't think of right yeah, now. Yeah, they 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 change all of the uh, stand names into things in English, and a lot of the stands I really feel like they could just keep them as the Japanese like way they have it, and it kind of irritates me. Did you guys notice yeah, that? Yeah, but like Bcom said, it's for licensing issues because they're all named after actual bands and stuff like that. Oh, so, uh, okay. Yeah, well, I guess most of them yeah. are named after like English bands. Yeah, like Sticky Fingers is a Rolling Stones song, stuff like that. I guess, but yeah, and then um, my favorite characters are probably it's probably a tie between Leon and Narancia. Like those are my two favorites. <laughs> oh, the dark brooding run and, and the really preppy outgoing one. Let's. Well, polar opposites well, here <laughs> Narancia isn't a preppy dude like Narancia is like i'm a badass teenager peppy. who's getting into shit peppy, <clears> not preppy. It's, uh, yeah. like i don't know he reminds me of me he's like i'm pissed i'm angry all the time and i do stupid things he reminds me of me when i was a teenager it's, it's uh it's leone and Narancia. thank you okay. <laughs> oh oh Le- leone yeah. and Narancia. Narancia. so pesky goes outside to okay. see uh prosecuyoto when Bruno comes unzipping from the side of the train, like all menacingly, Cat, did you notice that scene? Like how he comes unzipping out of the train, he's like got only half his shoulder, like half one of his eyes out, looking at him. It's like fucking oh, awesome. Yeah. It looks so good. There are a good. lot of scenes in this episode where they try to make Pese Pese like really menacing and sinister, but like he's such a fucking weird character that I just kept laughing. And no, I that, no, take that was Bruno seriously. coming out of the train. And he like surprises oh, okay. the shit out of a Pesci. Pesci. Cause, no, because there's a scene where I made a specific note where like Pesce 
Peske, whatever Pesci. the fuck. Pesci. <laughs> it, Pesci. I don't give a shit what his name is. Mm-hmm. He like steps on this guy's neck and is like, I need to get serious. And he's like supposed to be he's all like, menacing. I've killed for the first time and it was nothing. Yeah, it's and, like, and, like, God all I could do it, is dude. laugh hysterically because like I know he's supposed to be menacing, but like his the way his character is drawn, you can't take him seriously. Yeah, <laughs> you just it's... can't. I mean, yeah. I think this is pretty much intentional for the most parts. Like, you never were supposed to take him int- uh, seriously, so it's even funnier. And then, like, well, they they even try though to like make it like, oh, well, he, he's dangerous, but like, oh, no, he's not. So this is the final <laughs> fight, and like they square up, and like even Bruno makes a point. He's like, this is a man who looks like he's witnessed ten years of murders or something like that, and like <laughs> they square up, and like Pesci goes like straight for the heart. And, like, Bruno has a stand put up both his arms to block it, but it goes through both the arms and into his chest towards his heart. But what the thing was, Bruno did that so he could actually grab a hold of his line. And he was actually able to, like, whip it up, get some slack, and loop it around his neck and, like, do a 280-degree turn of his head. (laughs) Oh, I did. Yeah, that was pretty. Because at first I wasn't. I couldn't figure out what he did to kill him. And I was like, what? And I had to rewind it a few times. Yeah, I mean, if you break it down, I don't think you could even still do that. But anyways, yeah. He it loops around his neck and twists his neck. But Pesci is still not giving up. He picks up the turtle and he's like going to smash it, which will kill everybody else because they're still in there. And then like Bruno's like, you know, when I first saw you, you know, when I saw you now, it looks like you had some good resolve and honorable man, but you're not honorable now if you're going to do that before you die. So... What uh, Pesci didn't anticipate was that Bruno can fire his Stan's fist and it fucking punches him in the face and then he just unzips him to a million tiny pieces and throws him in like the river next to him. So you could say he feeds him to the fishes. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It also turns out that Trish has a stand herself that is like just starting to manifest. And basically she what she did was accidentally punched like a giant claw slash paw mark in the ground. So that's really cool. And I want other shows to take from what this show did that in the EDs, you see everybody stands except Trish's. Mm-hmm. So you don't get ruined by knowing that eventually she gets a fucking stand. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, so like, and I, I also hope that they actually make Trish more of a character eventually. Cause like, I think she's so really going to get developed now that she's getting a stand. Yeah, because like so far she's spoken like maybe a dozen words, and I'm kind of <laughs> like, come on, like make her a person. Like, well, early on they were trying to make her like really aloof and act like she was better than them, and not even well, worthy they to could even do talk that to and them. Still let her speak, right? Hmm, like, I like the way it did. But anyways, they all get away. But then we see a guy called Melone. Is that right? Become mm-hmm, that's right. Shows up and he's like talking on his phone to somebody and he reports what he finds and he takes a sample of Bruno's blood and he's a little bit excited about that. So I'm wondering <laughs> if his stand may have a play into that. We'll find out. But I also become, wonder if the bad guys are named Prosciutto and Melone because Prosciutto and Melon go together. But I'm not sure about <laughs> that. <laughs> That's uh, Prosciutto was partnered up with uh with Pesci. Yeah. Pesci. So Yeah, so I Pesci mean really funny. Oh, well, Pesci means fish, yeah. So <laughs> a fish singular and ham. fish. Yeah, <laughs> fish and ham together. Uh, I don't know yeah. how well that would go. I mean, it wouldn't be that, that bad, actually. I could see that happening. That could work. Well, but, like, anime is weird about naming people. Like, why Why do all an anime have to name people after This is not the show reasons? to make this breakdown like, for. JoJo is its own thing entirely. <laughs> yeah. It, it names things after the craziest shit possible, so. I guess, but, like... I don't know. It just made me think of how like Hollywood actors name their mm-hmm. kids like Apple and shit. And I'm just like, why are we all doing this? What's happening? <laughs> what is life? This is true. All right. Yeah. Well, this, this show's pretty fun. I'm like, I'm happy we're covering it as I'm catching back up with everything uh, with JoJo. It's been fun. How far did you make it? You said you watched. The- so I, I basically watched like the whole first season and I'm starting into the second. And though, but so for this, I watched the episode 13 and a half recap. And then I watched episodes 14, 15, 16. So I, I have like some knowledge of where we are right now, but I'm still like trying to fill in the gaps, basically. Okay. So yeah. But speaking of filling in the gaps, speaking of filling in all of her gaps, domestic girlfriend, <laughs> episode three. Oh, oh yeah. Is it true after all? So 
Near the beginning of this episode, we're introduced to one of the elements I like the least about this show. And that's where Natsuo heads to a cafe where his friend Fumiya works, who has, like, the shiny Gendo Akari glasses that we were talking about earlier with uh, Gilda in Promised Neverland. Yep. Uh, he says hi to one of the workers there and is like, hi, uh, Masaki Kobayashi. And the guy gets, like, really angry saying, like, uh, my name's Marie. I've told you, like, a million times, tell, call me Marie. And it's played off like a joke. Uh, but it's, like, if somebody asks you to call them a specific name, you should probably do it unless you're, like, a total asshole. Like, or if the name <laughs> is, like, ridiculous or something. Um, and it seems like the way Marie is dressed is, like, either they are transgender or they are, like, cross-dressing or they are, Does like... He- yeah. It didn't, I couldn't tell if it was like some short shorts or like a skirt. <laughs> it was it was almost a skirt, if not just like shorts like that looked like a skirt and like long stockings like all the way up. And so mm. I'm like, all right, like this person like clearly is like sort of identifying as female. And so not so just like saying like, oh, I'm just going to call you by your your real quote unquote name because fuck you is a little bit of a douchebag thing to do. And they just play it off as a joke, but it's a little shitty. So anyway. After that, though, Fumia tells Natsu that he's probably jealous of, like, Hina's boyfriend. Because, like, Natsu's like, I'm feeling, like, really weird right now after everything that went down with, like, Hina and, like, getting all upset over her boyfriend outside their house. And Fumia, like, kind of empathizes, saying, like, yeah, I'm jealous of all these women that come into the cafe asking for advice for Marie. And, like, one of them in particular is this office worker whose boyfriend is cheating on his wife to be with her. And they should just all dump their boyfriends and come be with me because I'm better. Um, (laughs) And so like, Uh, not so like Fumio like start like reenacting what that scene might have sounded like with not so like pretending like the guy would say something like, I plan on leaving my wife, but it just can't be right away, you know? And, uh, but like he's dismissing it like, oh, this is just like a catchphrase you would only hear in movies. But Fumio is like, no, like that's exactly what the guy said. (laughs) So (laughs) as they're walking home, Fumia, Fumia is on the street and he points out, oh my god, that's the office worker I was telling you about. And of course, it's the older sister, Hina. And mm-hmm. the pieces of the puzzle kind of fall together into Natsuo's mind of like why Hina's been so upset and distant yeah. lately. Isn't it so convenient he sees her? It is really convenient, but this yeah. show is dumb, so... <laughs> Then why the fuck are we covering this garbage? The whole point is this show is dumb fun for me and Kat. Like, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> it's just a piece of trash. I mean... Mm-hmm. I've already lived through this once. I don't want to do it again. <laughs> oh, poor Leo. It's so hard for him. <laughs> so, uh, Natsu decides to confront Hina about this because, like, he's all morally justified, he feels like. So he goes to her bedroom that night and, like... He presses her, like, into admitting that she's having an affair. Like, he repeats that line that, like, he, the guy apparently said about, like, how I plan on leaving my wife, but not just, like, can't be right away. He's playing her. I mean, come on. It's obvious, right? Yeah. Well, and so Hina says, like, though, she stands up for herself and she's like, so what? It's part of, like, a grown-up's world that children shouldn't step foot into. Oh, fuck you. Telling Natsu to fuck off, basically. Uh, Which I kind of agree with her. Like... As much as like, well, it's like yeah. it's none of anyone's business but her own, honestly. Pretty much, yeah. Um, but like, I can understand why he's worried for her, and later why Rui is worried for her too. Um, but yes. So as Hina tries to get Natsuo to leave, he takes it a little too far by forcing a kiss on her, and <sighs> she enjoys the kiss for a moment, like closes her eyes, and then pushes him away and slaps him really hard. But then grabs him back and kisses him again. <laughs> oh, I know. He's like, give, let me let me just give you all the mixed signals that are possible. In <laughs> Let's this just world. confuse the shit out of this kid. I know. Uh, and so then she goes in though, like she pushes him down onto her bed and like rips open the top button of his shirt and then like leans in and then he clearly just gets really scared because he doesn't know what's happening and he's not ready for this and she realizes it because like when she looks into his eyes she tells him like you try to act all bold and cool but like when i look at you i can see you're just like a scared little child my my thought was i wish women would be a little more aggressive like he is sometimes yeah but guys don't like it guys like to be the aggressor i said sometimes Just every once in a while, just like, damn, girl, where the fuck did this come from? But all right. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, on one level, this scene is operating on like a super sexy moment that like some guys would like to be a part of. On the other level, it's operating on like, what the fuck is happening? What is she doing? Um, <laughs> well, but she's a fucking teacher or whatever. Yeah. And like she's hitting on her student. Also, this is like her younger brother now. Yep. Like there's so many <laughs> levels of fucked up in this scene. Like and, and we're also, watching it. Oh god. Yeah. It, it basically it's kind of like uh oh you couldn't handle me kind of scene and it's funny, but like at the same time like dude, like come on, girl. Like don't do that shit. Um and I and I deemed this scene the welcome to inappropriate behavior land scene. Like everything is wrong with this scene. Like why is he in her business? Why is he kissing her? Why is she trying to fuck him? <laughs> like what the fuck? <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. And then like so he's devastated by this, right? He like leaves the room and as soon as he does, like Hina to her credit like face palms and slides down to the floor and's like what the hell am I doing? Cuz like something came over her obviously in this moment that like she wanted it was almost like a self-defense mechanism went off and then like she wasn't completely in control of her actions. Um, and so, like, he goes back to his room, and he just, like, cries like a little bitch, because, like, he just got destroyed by her. Oh, what a little bitch he yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> and so, okay. Uh, the and next this forever mo- sets up okay. his trauma with women. Mm, it's not S.H.I.E.L.D. I, hero, though. <laughs> I would like to think so. <laughs> next morning, Natsuo's dad discovers a note saying that Natsuo is going to stay at his friend's house, and, like... The dad and the new mom like immediately wonder if he's like upset at their remarriage and he's kind of put them in a good position to think that way because like he hasn't given them any information why he's upset so that they I understand why they feel that way. So he goes to Fumia's house and like Fumia like listens to this whole story. He's like, well, this might be great news for me because if like you're done with Hina, that frees me up to go after her and I'll console her for all the shit that just went down between you. And like he imagines himself as this like bishi boy in this little like dream of his where he's going to hook up with Hina and they start like wrestling and stuff because they're pissed at each other. Uh, but like eventually Fumia is like not so like you need to move forward. Like you should get back to like writing your novel or whatever. Um, and so he tries to do that, but he can't concentrate. And so he looks out the window onto the street and sees Rui out there, like, in the rain, like, looking for him. And she's, like, checking under, like, cars and, like, in a dumpster. And she eventually, like, looks up at the window and she's like, oh, there you are. Um, and it turns out, like, she asks him if she can also stay at Fumia's house because she doesn't want to be around Hina at all. Um and, like, there's a funny moment where Natsuo introduces Rui to Fumia's mom as, like, his younger sister. And Rui, Rui's like, no, I'm your older sister. And then they both, like, give their birth date. And then, like, she just gives this epic pout face when she realized she's, like, his Emoto. And she didn't know it. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it turns out Rui's, like, pissed. And she's been pissed off for a while at Hina's behavior. Like, with this whole affair that she's known about for a while. And so, like, she wants to also run away from home for a bit to, like, boycott her actions and her behavior. And Fumia also, like, intelligently figures out, like, the reason Rui had sex with Natsu in the first place was when Hina told Rui that she wouldn't, she couldn't understand her because she's never been held by somebody who loved her before or somebody who she loved. And so Rui, like, went and, like, immediately had sex so she could understand what that felt like so she could, like, get back at her sister. (laughs) Well, which which is like so flawed, right? Because it's like, well, but this person you just met doesn't love you, so yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, like, yeah, Ruby and Natsu re- return home that night after they come up with like a strategy with Fumia. Uh, but they discover like their parents have like divorce papers on the table because they're just getting ready to like separate because like if their kids are going to run away from home obviously they care more about that than like being together which is which the is only good thing in this show because you're like oh they're willing to put their children before them yeah <laughs> they're good parents like and i liked natsuo's dad who like goes over uh to natsuo and says like hey like next time just please come talk to me if you have like concerns or like you're worried or you're upset about something like don't just run away which is like, yeah, that's the right thing that an adult should say to him in that situation. She, he should understand like his actions have consequence, consequences like that. So Hina also like breaks down crying and kind of apologizes. But like the next morning, 
Natsuo is like pretty cold to her when he passes her on the stairs and he goes down to the breakfast with Rui and is like, all right, we're going to carry out our plan tonight. Whatever the hell their plan is. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, you don't know. But, um, yeah. but it'll be interesting. <laughs> I don't know. I, I did. I did think it was funny. I saw this um, scene at the very beginning of this episode where it's like, oh, your usual. Like he's at the cafe and they're like, oh, your usual iced cocoa. And I'm like. That is literally chocolate milk. <laughs> that is what that fucking is. Admit it, you child. You like chocolate milk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, uh, I, there's like a, a famous drink at this uh, restaurant called Serendipity in New York City, which is the movie Serendipity is like, I think, based on the name of this restaurant, which is called Frozen Hot Chocolate. Uh, mm-hmm. Which is like they make hot chocolate, then they actually like freeze it into almost almost like a smoothie, kind of like like a really rich chocolatey smoothie. So there is such a thing as like frozen hot chocolate, at least I don't know. But. It's chocolate milk. <laughs> it's milk <laughs> with chocolate syrup in it. You know what that is? Mm-hmm. It's chocolate milk. Okay, maybe throw in some marshmallows if it's hot. You have a point. Yeah. <laughs> I might make some hot chocolate milk after this. I'm, I have I have chocolate syrup. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, so now we've got Kaguya-sama, Love is War. Oh my god, you guys are going to kill me with the second half of these episodes. <laughs> oh, nah, nah. Um, Okay, episode three of 12. I, I'm not reading that whole fucking thing. It, there's there's different sketches, you'll see. <laughs> there's three sketches per episode, and they all have yeah. different titles. And none of them are very interesting this time, so who cares? Yeah, exactly. Neither well, okay, the sketches are interesting The first either. one I had fun with. <laughs> The first one I had fun with. Uh-huh. So, so Naughty Magazine was confiscated, was taken from a student, and the president president asked them to dispose of it. Um, and the magazine, like, they start flipping through it, which is like, ha, like, <laughs> they're not supposed to be reading it, but they are. Um, the magazine says that 34% of high school students in Japan have had sex, and this astonishes Chika. And meanwhile, Miyu- I know she's like, oh, I can't believe that many. And meanwhile, Miyuki well, you was say hoping- have sex, but they say have done it. <laughs> but that's the same thing. They've but, had but sex. They're setting it up they've, as they've, a misunderstanding like, their- and it killed the entire joke for me because I'm like, I see where they're going with oh, this. Oh, you it's saw where misunder- they were going? I didn't see it's where they were going. It's a misunderstanding immediately. I well, like, I okay, saw where they were going funny. once Kaguya was like, oh, I know exactly what it is. And then I was like, okay, she doesn't. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. But um, I-, I thought like, I don't know, this astonishes Chika. And meanwhile, Miyuki's like, oh, is that magazine have porn with pubic hair in it? And he's like all excited. <laughs> he's like... <laughs> Oh, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. Japanese porn does not have pubic hair. <laughs> no, um, it's all blurred. <laughs> yep. And then I-, I thought it was weird that like 34. Uh, percent They're like, oh, that's so high, and like, oh my gosh. And I, I was thinking, like, it's Japan. <laughs> well, but then I was like, uh, in the U.S., I'm sure more kids are having sex than 34. percent Because like, I don't know. I mean. Well, I was doing it in high school, and I'm sure y'all were too. Mm-hmm. So, like, I was looking at s- studies, right? And yeah, I was like, okay, same CDC. Here. I also what thought, does it say? Mm-hmm. I, I said, I also thought, I thought it was a funny, different way for Japan trying to get people to have kids again. Like, they kind of peer pressure it <laughs> a little <laughs> <Yeah>. bit, <laughs> and and I'm like, sitting here, and like at most times, I'd be bad. I'd be like, no, you can't do this. But then I'm like, you are trying to keep you know, a nation alive and on its feet. So I'm like, I mean, desperate times go over def- desperate measures. <laughs> but then I right guess. at the end, they say they cover their tracks by saying you should wait until marriage. Wink, wink. <laughs> I was like, oh, come on. You guys are killing me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I looked up some CDC stuff on the U.S. and like how many high schoolers. And I think this is from like 2017. That's so pretty, pretty recent. Hmm. Um, and they found out only 40% of high schoolers have had sexual intercourse in the U.S. And I was like, what? Only 40? That's not that different. And it's it's come like, down a lot. Because, like, I looked up numbers that said in, like, 1991, it was 51%. And then, like, huh. it, by 2015, it was, like, round 40, like you said. Yeah. See, and, and see, our parents' generation always criticizes, like, y'all have more sex. But, like, no, we have less sex, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. And, and also, like... I thought this was interesting. 10% of those high schoolers had had like four or more sexual partners. Jesus. 
Um, so like the ones who were getting around are getting around, and like I'm like, yeah, that was me. <laughs> oh my god, that was not then, me. Uh, <laughs> oh damn! Oh, you're the oddball that damn. become because Fucking I'm right there with Midwesterners <laughs> rolling yeah. in the cornfields. We got nothing better to do. We got uh, these cornfields exactly. to hide in. <laughs> we, we are in Indiana, become there's shit to do. Um, and then. 30% had had sex in the previous three months. And of these, almost 50% did not use a condom. And I was like, yes, this is familiar to me. <laughs> like, oh, no. Because, like, I remember being like, no, we need, to, we need to do this, like, with condoms. And all the kids would be like, condoms? I've never used condoms. Uh, most of the girls like, I knew were on birth control of some kind. Well, but, like, you still gotta use because like you've got to protect yourself from like stds and shit yeah, right but like nobody does because it's fucking india <laughs> <laughs> so, oh my gosh but yeah so i guess i was wrong and i this shocked me because i was with kagya at this point and i was like oh my god like there should be more and then I don't know. And then while well, Kaguya's talking about this, and you're like, whoa, Kaguya's like been in some shit. Like, she's experienced. Good for her. Mm-hmm. Like, Mi- Miyuki's like reading the phone book, and he's like, I'm pretending I'm not here. And Chika's just like, wow, maybe I should be more experienced. <laughs> um, and then Kaguya realizes, like, oh, Miyuki's nervous. And so she asks him if he has a girlfriend, and he deflects. And, like, basically, he's never had one, despite being really popular. And at at this point, they show that he got chocolates at one point with fucking pubic hair baked into it. (laughs) Yeah, that was the weirdest fucking thing ever. What fucking crazy bitch is like, you know what will make this man love me forever? If I give him chocolate with my pubic hair baked into it. No. (laughs) No. Oh my god! Yikes. I honestly then, didn't know what to think of that. I was like, "Is he having like a horror thought of like what Kaguya would give no, him?" No, that or? happened. Jesus, like that—that that was something that he experienced. Hmm. <laughs> That's crazy. I don't know. Please go on. Get this <laughs> anyway. episode over with. Oh, stop being a baby. Oh, we have a lot Leo. more to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so then it, it, the narrator explains that he's a twisted monster virgin, which. Basically, he's arrogant, but he's inexperienced. Like, he has high standards uh, and ha- has high thoughts of himself, but, like, maybe he shouldn't, basically. Um, and then I love where Kagi is like, I, he, you probably do it all the time with your little sister, and I do it all the time with my, like, nephew, and it was films. <laughs> and it's just hilarious, because at this point, you're like, oh, there's a misunderstanding, but, like, just the epicness this of point, the misunderstanding at this, this point. It took this long to figure it out. Oh, fuck off, Leo. It just, I'm just saying <laughs> it becomes more like obvious. And, and it's like the epicness of the misunderstanding is so great at this point that it's cute. No, um, it's not. You, this, you just really want to be negative on this, don't you, Leo? Like this, this really makes your day for some reason. It was ro- I was rolling my eyes. I was like, just end this already. I knew... Like I said, at the very beginning, I knew exactly where this was going, and I just didn't care anymore. There's no mm. mystery, I guess. I mean, the the point isn't the mystery. The point is just to be Just get to the ED. At least that was entertaining. No, we got more to talk about before the ED. <laughs> yeah, stop being a baby. Um, And then, okay, so like Chica at this point, they realize like she thinks it's a kiss and not sex, right? Like that's what she thinks they're talking about. And they explain, like, oh, she doesn't know what sex is, and she's been sheltered, and all this. And Chica is like, President, I'll take this one for the team, or something. And, like, goes in valiantly to explain to her what sex is. And, like, Chica explaining sex is fucking hilarious. Because, like, she just whispers things, and you get, like, these little <laughs> snatches of what she's saying. Yes. And my, my favorite quote of hers was, like, after everything, she's like, moving like beasts. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's like a film strip and it's like 16 minutes later. <laughs> she's yeah. like been explaining the shit for that long. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I thought that was just Kaguya like processing it. Well, it's either that. It's either one, like Kaguya taking 16 minutes to process it or Chica like continuing to try to explain or like get snap Kaguya out of it for like 16 minutes. <laughs> either way, it's funny. <laughs> hmm. Oh, oh yeah but um i don't know and then the next sketch is like it's the two of them later in the evening in the office 
Kaguya decides to test Miyuki to see how much he knows about her with 20 questions where like he has to guess what she's thinking of in like 20 questions or less. Um, he apparently has never played this game before. Yeah, I don't know. And, and like he I, like she almost tricks him into thinking that she's saying that the object is him and that she likes him. And he like almost goes with it. And then he thinks about how devious she is and is like, oh, she would never do that. And then guesses the dog and it's correct. Um, and that was that sketch, because honestly, I didn't like that sketch at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, th- the thing is, one of the like uh, 20 questions 101 is you ask if it's in the room. He got the question nine, and I like I want to pull my hair. I'm like, just fucking ask if it's in the room. That's like sometimes that's the first question you ask because that tells you so much already. And he just won't do it, and that would have told him everything because she would have had to have said no. Mm-hmm. It yeah, I just thought that one was really dumb. It was just another one where like I figured it out immediately, and I'm just sitting here going, "You're being an idiot. <laughs> Stop it." I'm sorry. Is the person who loved Doreku through the entire thing talking to me about idiots? <laughs> Unbelievable. The one who picked what was that dumb show with the with the half naked women and the the uh, armed girls Machiavellian? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, there was nothing better that season. Explain to me how armed girl Machiavellian is, is oh, more fascinating. It's the same than argument. Show. I've said there's nothing better that season. It's still probably the most entertaining one. And Doriko, I still still think is a smarter show than this one. Uh, I think everything in this show is Leo, pretty you're dumb. Leon, salvation. I don't know what to do with you. <laughs> My stand I don't know. is activated. Okay, <laughs> I can't be stopped. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kat, so continue, continue. E- explain to me what the fucking third part was even about. Yeah. Okay. I have a theory, but that's it. Yeah. So the next step, the next sketch is that one day a cat is in the engine of their limo, and Kaguya really wants to walk to school for once. I think she planted she the cat has. on purpose. <laughs> she might well, have, or she had is devious do it. like that. Like, she would, <laughs> right? Yeah. So she, like, takes the opportunity. She's walking to school. She runs into this kid. Who wants help crossing the street? Uh, usually, I guess she goes with a friend, but now she's a different grade, so she can't walk with her anymore. Um, and I mean, the kid's cute, but like, so fucking annoying. Like, cries so damn much. Um, she Kaguya is like, "Oh, you should meet up with your friend and continue to walk to school with her from now on because you love her so much." And like, she helps her meet up with her friend, and they go off. And at this point, Kaguya is like, "Oh shit, I'm gonna be late." She meets up with Miyuki, who's, like, speeding on a bike to get to school on time as well, and, like, hops on the back, which is technically illegal in Japan, yeah. and they, like, get to school, because they're like, it's more important to get there on time than to follow this, like, law. <laughs> um, and, like, this is a good memory for her, right? Like, she gets to ride on his bike and, like, feel happy and all that shit. Um, my theory is that you're going to find out later in the series, and this is so stereotypical, I will admit. That the little kid is Miyuki's sister. And that he was late because he was trying to help her with something. Oh, it's possible. Hmm. My only theory about this is that Kaguya has been a total bitch up to this point, And they, the, the writers of the show and the manga wanted to make clear that she's not always an, a mean person. Like she has like nice qualities to make her more waifu accessible. That's my theory about that whole scene. Uh, I, you're probably the most right. <laughs> <laughs> That's also true, I think. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Yeah. But now we got to talk about the ED because it's clearly the best part of the episode and it's what everybody wants to hear about. <laughs> Okay, that 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 dance was awesome. The, the dance that is was amazing. It's, it wasn't just yeah. the dance; it's how well that was animated. Like I, every time I watch it, I'm like, "Did they maybe possibly rotoscope this?" They did. They like, mocapped it. So okay, because I was like, "This confirmed. is so fucking on yeah. point." <laughs> the dancer who mocapped it also like wore uh, Chica's dress that she's wearing that little black dress to like make it even easier it for moved, the key animator. It moved way too well. <laughs> <laughs> So it's like, yeah, it's just like Chica dancing around in like the school student council room saying like, telling like the story of the student council, like everybody loves us and I'm Chica, I'm the love detective and I'm going to solve every case, even if my IQ is only three. (laughs) It's just like the cutest thing. And um, 
Yeah, the key animator who worked on it uh, is Naoya Nakayama, who formerly worked at Kyoto Animation. He worked on like a silent voice and several other Kyoto Animation things like Beyond the Boundary and stuff. Clearly very talented. There were like 845 frames of key animation in this ED. Uh, and even though it was rotoscoped, like he had to like redraw all of those frames and stuff and like work from the rotoscope to make it fit the character design. And it just comes off like amazingly well. It's so good. Um, it was epic. Yeah. It was <laughs> it's like all I could see on my Twitter feed and on Reddit for like a week. And I still keep seeing it pop up like with different remixes of different like music, like rap music and stuff. It's just like the fucking best. I know you just posted two more things today in our <laughs> discord. I was like, God damn. How many versions of this thing am I going to freaking watch? <laughs> yeah, I posted like a version that has like just all of the keyframe animation instead of like the actual finished product because it's just is really cool to look at that process, especially when there's so many frames. Um, but yeah, man, they it must have taken so long. It, like I can't even imagine how long this took. It's ridiculous. And they continue to change the ED like every episode. So I don't know if we'll ever see this again. But yeah. Yeah, it, it was pretty epic and all that. We're still waiting for our submissions, guys. <laughs> oh, that's true. For I the forgot dance. About that. Do one of Chica's dances for us. Tell us which dance it is. Indeed. Where you're going to be entered in uh, Wife of Bcom. <laughs> Wife of Bcom contest. I hate this contest. <laughs> $50 so much. gift card. I'm telling you. Oh, fine. All I'm right. serious about this. We are serious All about right. that. I hate that we're serious about that. <laughs> What's the email become? What's it's the email? Uh, nerddom and other nonsense at gmail.com. <laughs> That's right. Uh, you could also like uh, send it to me on Discord if you want to, either way. But yeah, it's fine. All right, let's move on to the. <laughs> send it to you on Discord so we don't see it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, no, so. Send it to the email. We'll see it Basically, then. Basically, send get it deleted. to either Cat or I, and we'll make <laughs> yes. sure it's <Damn>. known. <laughs> Son of a bitch. All right, so the last show of the day on Sundays is Dororo. Uh, and this is episode three, the story of Jukai, who is that guy who's uh, giving you know dead bodies like prosthetics. So we get to find out what his whole deal is, and it's very interesting. Yeah, why he did it. And it's basically the flashback episode also of how... Uh, oh, what's that? How do you say that main character's name? He, uh, uh, Hyakimaru. Yeah. Hyakimaru. Basically how he ended up where he is now. So like mm-hmm. that's like the gist of this episode so it's 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 good and it's very informative yeah it starts off with a flashback of uh like the period of the sengoku jidai like with the unending wars and talking about how like japan is like leaving the ground soaked with blood as like the narrator is saying and we see one man in particular like cutting off these soldiers ears and like uh calling off their fingers and like nailing them to crucifixes and it's none other than jukai uh, who's like taking the wounded from the battlefield and like doing this as like a warning to any other rebels who might rise up against this Lord Sheba. And as he's doing so, I assume it's his wife. It's a woman who keeps saying like, dear, dear, stop doing this, like comes running towards him, pleading with him to stop. And like a samurai like plunges a sword through his wife's back, killing her. Yeah, it- did you? I thought that was an accident. Like he reflexively did it or something. It could it be. It seemed no. to me. I thought he saw somebody do that to his wife. Oh, no. Yeah, he whoever. didn't do it. I, yeah. No. Oh, yeah. okay. I got confused then. Because like, like I said, it's been a few weeks because I watched ahead for once. Yeah. Because I, I could not help it. I love this fucking anime so much. Oh, yeah. Whatever soldier did it said like throw, hang that up there too or hang it up there. Like, okay. like it's nothing. I was like, yeah. Okay. That makes more sense. And so I was surprised that like Jukai didn't like freak out and go try to attack this soldier. But like at the same time, he's completely devastated. He just wanders over to the edge of a cliff and just throws himself off. Yeah. Which is a totally another side of like having a, a reaction to it. Because mm-hmm. yeah, you like you said, you were surprised he didn't go and attack him. But then yeah. he didn't. He did basically the opposite, which is kill himself. traumatic experiences. You know, it's usually one extreme or the other. Right, so right. it's not 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 too surprising. Like, how can I possibly live with this guilt? Like, yeah, yeah. So the episode picks up after the OP, and it's now in black and white uh, as it's like a flashback. Basically, uh, we meet a boy named Kaname, whose master is Jukai, who has become this like saintly doctor, basically like fully dedicating his life to making new limbs for the people who need them. And he doesn't even pay- charge his patients money, like at least not all the time. And he just does it out of a sense of responsibility. 
uh, and like obviously atonement. Um, and so one day a woman brings her son to Jukai, whose arm has just been sliced off by some asshole samurai who picked a fight. <laughs> Basically. Yeah, like, what the yeah fuck? and I mean, at that point, it's not a fight. Yeah, like, no, it's not. It's just you completely bullying. You can't pick bullying. a fight with a kid that small. Yeah. And so, like, the woman tells Kaname that, like, she'd been afraid of Jukai, like, that he might be a scary man, because she had heard rumors that he used to serve Lord Shiba. And so Kaname confronts Jukai about this, and he's obviously really disturbed, because... We find out later that Kaname's uh, father died in that war against Lord Shiba. And so he blames Jukai for like basically killing his father. And it, like Juk- Jukai explains like what happened and how like he threw himself off the cliff and he fell into the ocean. And he was picked up by like a foreign ship and then went to a foreign country where he learned how to make prosthetics. Uh, and now has like returned to do that. Um. And so, like, Jukai, like, pleads with Kaname to allow him to, like, just let me alive, like, keep me alive just to, like, so I can fulfill this promise of this child that that woman just brought in, at least. And then you can decide to kill me or not afterwards. I just want to, like, fulfill my promise. And so I really like the imagery of the, in the scene also. There's, like, a flickering candle in the background, like, and it, it's either still or flickering based on, like, what Kaname's, like, anger level is at. <laughs> and oh, it's, yeah. I didn't notice that. It was, like, a really good uh, little visual metaphor. I liked it a lot. And so Kaname decides not yeah. to kill Jukai, but, like, throws down his prosthetic leg that Jukai had given him and takes up, like, a cane instead and saying that, like, you'll never be my salvation. And he just leaves. Um, hmm. I was kind of irritated at this because, like, I get him being angry at him. Mm-hmm. But, like, people have a right to change and, like, learn from their mistakes and all that. And I don't know. He's being a bit a bit too dr- – I mean, it's pretty obvious he's changed his whole life for the best. Like, I don't know. It's it's off. tough because, like, this person crucified his father. <laughs> like – <laughs> well, but you don't know he personally crucified his father. You just Maybe know the not. organization he worked yeah. for did that. Yeah. Well, I, I thought it was really interesting from Jukai's perspective because, like, he did these horrible things and, like, he did try to kill himself and that w- didn't work. So he kind of took it as a sign that he must do something else. So now his new way is, you know, to make prosthetics for, mm. uh, I almost said Porchetti. Uh, <laughs> make prosthetics for uh, uh, Maru and you know, yeah. not not just the dead people, you know, as kind of an atonement, but also for even living people, you know, so that they can, you know, go on functioning in life and whatnot. Yeah, because like right after this happens, he like kind of like falls down a hill by the riverside and just like passes out. And when he wakes up, Hyakimaro's boat carrying his like ravaged like little baby body is shows up like right next to him. Like, so it's clearly like mm-hmm. a sign from basically like Buddha or whatever that he's still needed. And so he, he reads it that way. And so like, then we get like a little bit of passage of time. A year later, Daigo back home holds his like newly born like son in his hands. Uh, what's his name? Totoshi Maru, I think. Tahomaru, Tahomaru. Oh, and uh, he's like laughing maniacally like that everything went his way. Uh, and then six more years pass, and we see that Hyakimaru now has, like, prosthetics. And it's, like, literally Naruto. He's, like, jumping from tree to tree. Like, he's just, like, a freaking ninja, basically. Um, and Jukai is, like, admiring the strength that he has to survive. And he names Hyakimaru. He gives him his name. Um, we see through Hyakimaru's eyes that Jukai has, like, a pure white flame. Uh, so he's definitely a good guy. And we see him learn some meaning of like some of the other colors for the first time because he picks up a flower that has a green aura, right? And when he picks it and separates it from the rest of the plant, it disperses and fades into a red aura, like which obviously represents like death, uh, especially from like episode two. You got that feeling, but he's learning it now for like the first time. And then as he's doing this, he's attacked by this giant white like Okami like spirit wolf, and Jukai like barely saves him. But, like, demons then visit their house that night. And, like, Jukai just, like, figures out, like, all right, demons are attracted to this kid for some reason. It's probably because of his powers or something. He doesn't yeah. know about his birth rights and everything. But he uh, he decides to train him to, like, protect himself. Um, yeah. And, like, while he's training him, like, you also see Daigo is training Tahomaru at the same time. Uh, and I also liked that, like, Tahomaru and his mother earlier in the episode both, like, keep sneaking looks at that like beheaded Buddha statue that's in their like family room. 
Uh, yeah, that's really cool. It's very <laughs> ominous, obviously, and they know something is not quite right, you know, here. So, uh, yeah the the way that uh, you see him like just be a badass as a kid is pretty epic. Like they they have some scenes where you're just like, fuck. Like, yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> crazy. Like he just like kills all these monsters, and he keeps growing up. Like, but like he's like slaying these like serpents and like all these like like demonic monsters and. Jukai actually starts to worry that like have I created a monster in my desire for like Hyakimaru to like live strongly like have I made the wrong decision yet again he's like really worried about this um, and then one day after defeating one specific demon like Jukai comes across Hyakimaru he's like shaking on the ground and his like right leg like muscle and bone and sinew just like regrows like right in front of him and he's like, mm-hmm. what the fuck? <laughs> and he, yeah, it, it sets off like up. thinking in his head, though. He's like, oh, this is kind of like how ghouls like sometimes like delude people into thinking they're benefiting them with their powers. But then they they take something away in return. And like so he figures out like maybe Hyakimaru's body was like taken away from him in some sort of arrangement like that. So he puts it together. Mm-hmm. And now he's regaining ghouls, it. But like demons, yeah, demons, and ghouls. Gods, yeah. yeah. Uh, so when he's old enough, Jukai basically sends Hyakimaru on his way with a pouch that was like in his like little boat that had his like family's crest on it. So he'll maybe hopefully find his way home. Oh, that'll be so interesting whenever he does confront his like family, especially his father. And uh, his brother, too, because like they're so set up to like fight each other in the end. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. Yeah, that'll be interesting. I agree. Um, and so... Back in the present, Dororo is around, like, he's wondering, like, what, what did the demons even want with Yakimaru's, like, eyes and nose? Like, what if they don't even need them? And, like, the wandering old man, like, Bi- Biwamaru says, like, maybe it fulfills their souls. How can we know? Um, <laughs> and, yeah, Yakimaru, like, awakens and, like, he puts his foot near the fire. And, like, they're like, oh, it looks like you've just rediscovered your sense of pain. And, like, he kind of is, like... He, like, he then just, like, launches his foot. He, like, stomps on the fire. Like, I don't know if he, like, wants to feel the pain or if he wants to believe that he's not this weak or something. But, like, he can't deal with it. Like, he has to take his foot out of the fire because it's, like, burning. No, it, it was very I confusing. T- yeah. What I took his it as, thought like, he's never was. felt anything his whole life. Yeah. Right? And he's feeling something and he's like, holy shit, what the fuck is this? Yeah. Because probably to him, that feels awesome just because it's something. You know, mm-hmm. maybe. And yeah. then that's that the last scene of that the episode is just Jukai who just like is continuing to wander around battlefields. <laughs> I and was just thinking, thank God he got his skin back first before he got his nerves. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. God. That would suck. that would have been awful. <laughs> oh man, it was a convenient order sucked. for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Jukai just says like, I can't go anywhere, Yakimaru, and it, it's just like he's continuously just atoning until this day for the sins of his past and he's kind of like stuck in this cycle but yeah i I thought this was a really really fantastic like backstory episode for like where where hyakimaru come from or sorry came from like who took care of him care of him how he was raised why he is the way he is uh they did a really good job with this well it was an epic like all of the episodes so far have been amazing Mm mm-hmm and this is, for me at least, like anime of the season. It's really good. It might be anime of the season. It's like tied up there with like Mob, basically, right now. It's so good. Oh, see, for me, I'm like this, this one. Mm-hmm. Not, not even a question. But I yeah. know. I feel like Mob like really stepped it up from their last season so far. <laughs> yeah, but this is amazing. This is like, like yeah, I said amazing in also. previews, like this is everything I wanted out of Angle Moi. Like this is so good. Like. <laughs> Just like as a historical piece, and and but also with like these spiritual elements to it, uh, and just beautifully yeah. animated. I kind of wonder if you know, since we kind of got Jukai's stuff out of the way, if he's still going to be involved, what what is his involvement going to be? I wonder if uh, Tahomaro will ever lose a limb, uh, Shakimaro's brother, and if Jukai will be there to like help him out. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Hmm. Or if well, um, Daigo realizes how much Hyakimaru cares about Jukai, like as like his basically like adoptive father, if like Daigo is gonna like threaten him at some point and like Hyakimaru is gonna have to save him. Yeah. I don't know. Well there's also the the Kaname guy. 
Yeah, I want to see if he comes off. back. Yeah, what's he? What's his deal? How is he involved in this story? I mean, they've set him up to be in it, but what? What's mm-hmm. his deal? <laughs> I'm curious if he'll become friends with uh, Yakimaro maybe at some point. I don't know. It'd be cool. Oh, that'd be crazy because then that would be very good lead to his uh, redemption of like Jukai. Yeah, because he saw how much he helped him. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Freaking great that. show. Yeah. Oh, all right. Oh. Anything else about it? it? No? no. No. I just thought it was epic. Like I said, this is one of the few shows where I was like, I can't wait. I want to watch it now. <laughs> yeah. So. I also just like am dying to see each new episode. It's so good. So. All right, everybody. We thank you for listening. Remember to like, follow, and subscribe to us on YouTube to get updates on new po- podcasts or videos. You can also find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and St- and Stitcher, and follow us on Twitter at Nerd and Other for updates. Also, join our Discord for some fun chats and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll just see everybody next episode. All right, yeah, see you around. very soon. Yeah, bye.